Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 750, please say aye. aye. 750 is recommended to the council. Approves a resolution RS 2017 751, approves an amendment to a contract between the State Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services to Metro for establishing agreed rates for court ordered evaluations and treatment for defendants charged with misdemeanor crimes. Is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 751, please say aye. aye. 751 is recommended to the council. Resolution RS 2017 752, uh, Cooper and Pardue as sponsors, approves a fire prevention and safety grant from the United States Department of Homeland Security to the Metro National Fire Department to implement a department wide training program designated to increase the investigative capacity needed to determine the act of arson or an arson-related crime. Is there a motion? Move. Motion made and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 752, please say aye. aye. 752 is recommended to the council. Resolution RS 2017 753, Councilman O'Connell, Pardue, and Cooper's sponsors approves a Nashville bike grant from the Tennessee Highway Safety Office to the Nashville Police Department to conduct vehicle and bicycle stops for the purpose of educating the public and gaining compliance with state and local ordinances. Is there a motion? Move. Motion made and seconded. Uh, seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 753, please say aye. aye. 753 is recommended to the council. Resolution 2017-754 approves an amendment to a letter of agreement for tobacco settlement funding from the State Department of Health to the Metro Board of Health to fund various programs addressing family tobacco use. Is there a motion? So moved and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue for discussion, all in favor of 754, please say aye. aye. 754 is recommended to the council. Resolution RS 2017 755 approves a grant from the Greater National Nashville Regional Council to the Metro Social Services Commission to provide delivered meals to eligible seniors and to provide transportation to elderly persons who are unable to drive and have no other means of transportation available. Is there a motion? Move. Motion made and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 755, please say aye. aye. 755 is recommended to the council. Resolution RS 2017-756 approves a grant from the Greater Nashville Regional Council to the Metro Social Services Commission to provide nutrition, home, and community-based services to eligible seniors throughout Davidson County. Is there a motion? Moved, Moved and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 756, please say aye. aye. 756 is recommended to the council. Uh, resolution RS 2017-757, Council Lady Wiener, Henderson, and Cooper sponsors, approves a grant from the Tennessee State Library and Archives to the Nashville Public Library to provide access and circulation of special materials formatted for individuals who are hearing impaired. I see our sponsor is here. There's also a letter to approve. Um, is there a motion? Moved and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue for discussion, all in favor of 757, please say aye. aye. 757 is recommended to the council. Resolution 2017-758 approves a grant from the State Department of Environment and Conservation to Metro Public Works Department to assist in the annual operation, maintenance, and facility improvements of a household hazardous waste collection facility. Councilman Elrod and Cooper is the sponsor. Is there a motion? Move. Motion made and seconded, and Councilman Glover. Just, just very quickly, um, uh, Chair, if you could, can you have the, the sponsor just tell us the, what, what we hope will accomplish out of this? Uh, I, I think I know, but I, I'd like to hear because I think it, it's a good idea. Thank you. All right, All right, Public Works is, however. Well, Sharon Smith from Public Works is here. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. This grant from the state is twofold. First of all, every year we get a grant from them to offset part of our operating costs for the East Convenience Center um, Household Hazardous Waste Facility. But that facility has been open since 2000, and it is um, in, a, in a slight state of disrepair. 
It also doesn't meet the current TDEC standards for household hazardous waste facilities, so they are funding us to uh, revamp that uh, facility and get it up to their standards. Most notably, uh, it's going to, we're going to be installing a uh, better ventilation system. Uh, the newer convenience center over off of Ezel Pike near the sheriff's office has a much better ventilation system. The state has looked at it. They want us to replicate that at the East Convenience Center. So um, about $85,000 goes towards operating and the balance of it will be uh, renovating that facility. Thank you. Thank Any, you, Chair. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you Councilman. Uh, thank you. Um, seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor of 758, please say aye. All opposed, 758 is recommended to the council. Uh, bills on second reading. Uh, bill number 2017-726, Councilman Mendez, Schwab, and others amends the Metro Code to add a requirement for the Department of Finance to maintain a written debt management policy for Metro government. And there is a proposed substitute. Um, is there a motion? Moved, Moved and seconded um, on the Substitute and Councilman Mendez. I'd like to move the substitute and, and describe for people what it does. Please. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So um, I met with uh, Metro Finance um, uh, once and then had subsequent communications by telephone about trying to um, get this dialed in. Um, the, the purpose, I think you'll recall, is to get a more in-depth uh, written debt management policy than the existing one um, that uh, uh, would help Metro going forward as far as what the total amount of debt and debt service obligations are and how to measure it um, uh, more ways. Um, Metro Finance has had a uh, debt management policy that's been approved um, previously by the state, and this would this would add more things to it. One of the things that was um, important to me to have added um, was that there would be more ways to describe um, uh, different metrics for measuring how much debt is appropriate. Typically, I think you, you all know that in the uh, budget presentation, we hear about debt service um, as a percent of the budget. Um, there are other metrics out there. And another thing that I wanted to get in there was a, a, a description, a discussion of what, if any, impact Metro's net pension obligation and unfunded OPEB obligations have on the amount of um, debt that's advisable for the city. Um, after going back and forth with uh, Metro Finance, uh, we hammered out um, the changes that you see reflected in the substitute, and I'd ask for everybody's support. Thank you, Councilman. Um, seeing no one else in the queue, all in favor of the substitute, please say aye. aye. All opposed, and then we're on to 726, the bill. And is there a motion? Moved. Motion made and seconded. Um, uh, unless Councilman Meadows, would you look, you've said okay. Then Councilman Glover. Mr. Jameson, uh, can you tell us what, what in essence does this do for this body and for the city? So the council has, uh, or Metro has had a debt management policy uh, starting in 2006, but it was never codified. This essentially takes that and adds, uh, I think more sophisticated is not more, is not the word, but more sensitive measurements of what our debt obligations are what our unfunded debt obligations are and how they contribute to our overall debt policy in a nutshell. And when do we start uh, under new federal guidelines? When do we have to start reporting that unfunded debt? I don't know. Does anyone in finance know? I'm, I'm wanting to say it's next year, isn't it? It'll, it'll be with the uh, fiscal year 18 closing. Okay, that is next year. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Councilman Mendez, you're also, all right. Uh, Everyone finish from the queue. All in favor of the passage of 726, please say aye. aye. All opposed, 726 is recommended to the council. Uh, bill number BL 2017 743, Councilman Mendez, Sledge, and others, is sponsored, terminates contract approved by ORDS number 096 567. Is there a motion? Move. Motion made and seconded. Um, Councilman Glover. That's you, from the that's previous. That's from before? Yeah. Councilman Pulley. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple questions of uh, Mr. Cooper with Metro Legal. I think I understand uh, what the intent of uh, this ordinance is, and I just want to make sure of some potential ramifications to that. Uh, this terminates our contract to house all federal prisoners. Is that correct? The uh, 1996 agreement applies to multiple federal agencies, um, including the U.S. Marshal Service. Um, so, it, yeah, it would essentially, essentially all federal inmates that are being housed temporarily, it, it would apply. Okay. Is uh, under preemption, is it possible that the sheriff could just exercise the authority to house those without such an agreement? That's an issue that we're still researching. Um, I don't have a, a good answer for that question right now, but it's one that we're, we're looking into. So we don't know the answer to that. And if you can't house those prisoners uh, uh, under preemption, then you would need a separate agreement in order to continue doing that. Is that correct? Right? All right. So is it, have there have been any attempts to negotiate such an agreement or who would be responsible for doing that? Uh, ordinarily, it would be the sheriff's office that would um, negotiate the agreement and then submit it to council for approval. Okay. And I, and to our knowledge, I, I guess maybe this is for the sponsor. Uh, are there any, have there been any attempts to negotiate a, another agreement to handle uh, federal prisoners outside of what the bill is intended to uh, cover? Um, our sponsor, Councilman Mendes. Uh, I would respond by saying yeah, I think it would be up to the sheriff. The The bill would call for the terminating of a 21-year-old agreement, and then the bill uh, calls for it to be renegotiated, subject council approval. Um, for for me, the, the main focus is we shouldn't be having perpetual uh, forever agreements. Um, and the, the while it's a it's a legitimate concern to know uh, how we're going to handle um, federal uh, detainees. I, I, I'm sure that, uh, for example, former Judge Moreland uh, was likely detained at the sheriff's facility under this contract. Um, so it, it is important, um, but uh, whether it's when the contract's 21 years old or 25 years old or 100 years old, um, that issue is going to have to be addressed. And my suggestion would be that there, um, uh, if if nothing else, good government requires that every you know 20 years or so, you ought to renegotiate a contract subject to approval of multiple branches of government rather than it just lasting forever. Is it possible to uh, make sure th to write the language in such a way that we can have a new contract in place before this one is terminated? Th the contract, um, the 21-year-old agreement had an initial term of 10 years, and then after 10 years, um, the contract uh, called allowed either side to terminate it on 30 days' notice. Um, I, I, I suppose... Um, in response to the councilman's question, um, one could give sort of uh, pre-notice notice, you know, tell, tell the U.S. Marshal Service that in 90 days we're going to execute um, the 30-day um, notice to terminate. So there was uh, four months to talk about it rather than 30 days to talk about it. I suppose um, that would be possible. I, I don't know how to necessarily write that legally that we're going to give notice of intent to exercise notice to terminate. Can you speak to that, Mr. Cooper? Other than having a um, termination date effective as of a certain date down the road, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that how that could could be accomplished. Um, I mean, I think if if it if it terminated on a date certain and that gave time to negotiate a new contract and get that approved before that date, that would address the issue that you raised. Obviously, my concern is I don't want uh, us to lose the ability because uh, uh, of the administrative uh, method in which we choose to handle termination of this contract to house federal prisoners during the interim. So. 
Uh, I would certainly be supportive of this in a way that we could re write the language uh, so that we could renegotiate a, a new contract and have it in place for other prisoners uh, and we don't lose the ability to do that because from what I heard you say, uh, Councilman, or excuse me, Mr. Cooper, uh, it, it, it appears as though uh, we still don't understand under federal preemption whether the sheriff would even have the right to do this without the contract. So I'm a little uncomfortable moving forward under those circumstances. So I don't know if it's appropriate. Uh, uh, would, would the sponsor entertain a deferral until we can get answers to these questions? Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I, I, I guess uh, uh, I'm, it might be a matter of terminology, but I, I don't understand how federal preemption could allow the, the sheriff to do something. Um, uh, I, I think the, the way I'm hearing the question is whether the sheriff has the unilateral right to hold prisoners for um, entities other than Metro without uh, Metro signing off on it. And is that the way you're understanding what Mr. Pulley is talking about? Yes, I believe he's, he's asking whether an, a, a written agreement is required in order for the sheriff to hold um, detainees on behalf of the federal government. Let me ask this question. Um, if, uh, if the sheriff wanted to hold de detainees on behalf of uh, Knox County without there being a contract, would, would he be allowed to do that? I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I'll, I mean, that's just something we'd have to look at. I mean, ordinarily you have intergovernmental agreements for these type things. That's yeah. why, why you have intergovernmental agreements. And, and all intergovernmental agreements as a matter of state law have to be approved by the council, right? Correct. Um, it, so in, in response to the councilman's question, on this uh, federal preemption, we're calling it, issue no. Um, I, I, I think that's a, a non-issue. Um, there, there isn't, uh, I, I don't really understand the concept there. On the idea of giving um, a uh, termination notice that's 120 days is the hypothetical I made up rather than 30 days, um, I, I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't mind um, that. I think I think that actually is a pretty reasonable suggestion to make the notice so it's three, four, five months out to allow plenty of time to negotiate it. So you think, th uh, so you're talking about four months, that's reasonable to negotiate a new contract under these situ this situation? Uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna let Ms. Legal Director Cooper answer that. I mean, uh, Surely, reasonable human beings could negotiate it in a week. Um, you know, get the government involved. Who knows? So that said, um, would I, I'm trying to think what the best course of action from here is, whether to move to defer it or uh, uh, amend this bill in some fashion. Well, it, if I may, Mr. Chair, and I'm sorry, we're having a no, colloquy. No, no. And uh, we'll get to some other folks in the queue in a, in a moment here. Um, a after hearing other people's comments, um, I'm interested in um, this suggestion. Um, uh, I mean, if that's if that's the thrust of the comments, then I think the idea of trying to, um, uh, uh, if the committee's choice is to defer for one meeting, um, then that would leave time to have an amendment to make it be, you know, well, let's say 120 days instead of 30, but I am interested in other comments. I'd be interested in that. I w so can I move to have this deferred for one meeting? Um, you uh, you can, Did you? should we have some other discussion before you make that motion? Okay. Okay, so let's have some I'm other, finished. other discussion. <clears throat> well, we uh, can come back to you, Councilman. Council Lady Wiener? is, if I can get this machine. Yes, Council Lady Weiner. Thank you, Chair, I appreciate it. Um, I've never done this before, but I got in touch with the Attorney General's office and I asked for opinions, and I gave them about 12 questions that I would like to have answered, and I would also like to have answers from Metro Legal before we move forward with this, so I would support a deferral on this. I think that if we're gonna renegotiate a contract, I'd like to know the parameters within which we're able to work. Um, when we renegotiate a contract, 
I want to make sure that we're working within the confines of state, local, and federal law. And so I want to make sure that all those things are in place before we move forward on anything um, in, in so far as renegotiating this contract. And so um, I would support a deferral. I don't know that we can get it done in one meeting. So I would probably entertain a longer deferral. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Council Lady Dowell. I'm just going to concur with uh, what Council Lady Weiner said. I think she took the words right out of my mouth with the exception of I did not reach out to the Attorney General, but I do have quite a few questions about this. And I do believe that it warrants more conversation just among this council body. Um, I do not think it's ready for any type of policy to be passed at this time or any type of legislation. And so I do support a deferral. Um, I, don't, I don't, I agree, I don't think we're gonna be able to have this discussion and get it to where it needs to be with uh, one meeting, Councilman Mendez. I would ask that you defer this until we can have more discussion and get a piece of legislation uh, that is sufficient to pass. It's just too many questions out there and I would like to have some more conversations about and understand um, you know what uh, we're doing and also it's complying with the federal and state law so I also move to defer it thank you thank you council lady uh, councilman Glover thank you chair uh, director Cooper it, well let me ask mr. Jameson a question first and then I'll come back to you if you don't mind director uh, because the next meeting falls on 4th of July we're obviously not meeting that day we're gonna be meeting on July the 6th are all the committee meetings gonna be on that particular day I think they'll be the day before on the fifth. We will have, so we'll have committees on the on the fifth. Okay, that that's going to be a long night based on uh, what I've seen in the preliminary agenda. Uh, Director Cooper, now to, to you, if we deferred only one meeting, does that really give you sufficient time to answer some of the questions that have been raised here? Because I think I think your office has to be involved in the conversation, uh, as does obviously the sheriff's office. Because what I would like to do is have the sheriff, you know, talk to us or talk to you where we can understand what the unintended consequences of this action might happen to be if we were to pass it. There may not be any, but there may be. And so I think from my standpoint, I would prefer to give you more time rather than less to try and get the questions answered. What, what are your thoughts uh, on that concept? Well, I think it depends on what the questions are. Um, I mean, if there are 15 questions from Council Member Weiner, um, depending on the scope of those, I don't, it, it may take some time to research, but I, I, I don't know. Um, we've had attorneys in our office who have been working on this issue for about a week and a half, um, researching it. And um, so I, I just, it, it depends on the scope of the questions. Then what, what I would, what I would um, ask the committee to entertain is let's defer this until the first or the second meeting in August, whichever uh, we think is best. That would still give the opportunity for if, if it's gonna be rewritten and if it's gonna be amended for a 90 day notice or whatever you guys come up with uh, of the way that we should do this. But I, I'm, I'm like Council Lady Weiner. I, this, this is an arena I don't have anything, any, a clue on, um, but I certainly wanna make sure that we understand what we're doing uh, with this. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna move that we defer until the first meeting in August uh, to give the law department time, the sheriff's department time, to talk and, and, and really kind of walk it through, and then also the sponsor time to come back and do the amendments uh, uh, with this bill that will adequately uh, address concerns. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, back to Councilman Mendez. Well, and this uh, motion to defer, um, I would urge people to vote against this. Um, it's, it's uh, I mean, I understand the underlying subject feels complicated because um, on some level it gets to immigration issues. Um, but the bottom line is there's a 1996 contract that hasn't been reviewed by the administration or the council in 21 years. Um, there shouldn't be um, uh, permanent forever contracts for any agency. The standard in Metro is 60 months. Um, getting this uh, terminated and renegotiated shouldn't shouldn't be that complicated. And so I'd urge people to vote against the deferral. Right, filling out the discussion, Council Lady Vircher. Thank you, Chair. I would like to encourage the committee to vote in favor for the deferral. There's too many questions that's unanswered. We don't know the time frame required to negotiate another contract. Um, we don't know the time frame for the notice. We don't know how this is going to impact the sheriff's office. Um, I encourage this committee to 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 support the deferral. 
thank you, Council Lady. Uh, I think uh, Council Lady Weiner, did you have a follow-on? I do. Thank you, Chair. Just for a second, um, I'll do respect to the sponsor. It has been 21 years, and I don't think waiting until August is going to cause any any harm in making absolutely sure that when we renegotiate a contract, we do it with all the facts. Um, we have had other issues that have come before us, and we have taken the exact same stance where we said we really need to have all the facts and we need to be deliberate in our decision making. And I think this would be just another example to our constituents that we're doing just that. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Council Lady. Um, and then, uh, Councilman Mendez, <coughs> did you have any follow on? Uh, if I repeat my same points and other people are going to repeat their same points. <laughs> so, right. uh, I mean, I, I just don't think uh, we need to delay that long. Okay. Well, following the, um, there, there is a motion on the floor for deferral. Um, interpreting the will of the group, I've heard different periods of time. I guess Councilman Glover's was the most definitive to defer to the first meeting in August, which is the formal motion on the floor. Is there a second? And there's a second, so, um, and we have s some more discussion. Council, Council Lady Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was, um, I, maybe you could just hear the explanation for all the way to August. I wasn't clear about that because I'm not, is the contract in place now? Is there a contract in place now? Okay, I just want to be clear, but I'm trying to understand what the difference is between a month and um, one week deferral, I, I wasn't quite clear about that. And I wasn't clear about the questions just based on um, what Mr. Cooper had shared with us. Like, I don't, I don't know that it, how do we come up with the month? I'm not clear about that. Um, Councilman Glover made the motion. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. The, the, the reason I came up with it is because we have a 4th of July holiday hitting in between here. Council Lady Weiner has got a, a long list of questions that she's uh, put together. Uh, I think there's been several questions. Chair, if it, I think this also gives uh, plenty of notice to the sheriff and the sheriff's department to be here and talk with us in case we have specific questions. I also think it gives time during the, the summer months when a lot of folks may be on holiday or on vacations that it gives Director Cooper time to, to research to where when we come back at first week of August, or the first meeting in August, excuse me, uh, maybe we can have some more definitive answers. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Gilmore. Okay, thank you. I was just trying to uh, understand, um, and I do have a little, uh, a stronger understanding. I would suggest then, it's, it's my understanding, it, it cannot be amended on the third, but maybe to move it to the second and then uh, defer it. So let it go through um, through the committee tonight, not defer it, and then when it gets to second, uh, do that. Okay. Is it on second now? Aw, uh, right. I'm sorry. Maybe to... Yeah, I can't help you then. Right. <laughs> so there's a motion which is seconded to defer it to the first meeting in August. Uh, any further discussion from council members? Councilman Mendez? I, I mean, I, I hate to keep going in circles, but um, I, I, need to, I need to respond. Um, the, the attorney general is not giving an opinion on a hypothetical piece of legislation. So the questions from the attorney general, that's not going to happen. Um, and as far as Metro Legal, um, you know, I, I assume they will answer. I know that Mr. Cooper has uh, and his staff have been thinking about these issues since at least January and thinking about this legislation in particular for a couple of weeks. I, I don't think it's going to take them uh, very long to respond to the questions. This is uh, simply terminating a 21-year-old agreement um, and renegotiating a new one. There's no way the new one will violate state law or federal law because the federal government will be a party to it and they'll, they'll make sure they insist on their rights being defended. So there's plenty of safeguards in place here. And uh, so again, urge to defeat the motion to defer. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, Council Lady Gilmore, did you uh, have? I th yeah, no, I think, I think we're um, clear. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, the motion is made and seconded to defer the bill to the first meeting in August. All in favor of the deferral to the first meeting in August, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? The, is, uh, the committee's recommendation will be to defer to the first meeting in August. Um, 47, 
743. Bill number 2017-744 approves the parking agreement, uh, Councilman O'Connell and Elrod and others as sponsors, approves a parking agreement between the Metro Traffic and Parking Commission and Warner Music Incorporated for the use of up to 35 parking spaces for a fee in the library parking garage. Is there a motion? Move. Motion made and seconded. Uh, Council Lady Murphy. Is there someone here who could um, answer how many how many parking spots are in this parking garage and how many are already contracted out? Yeah, here is uh, Sharon Wallstrom from Public Works. Good evening, I'm Sharon Wallstrom with Public Works. Um, I have some of that information, but I'm not sure that I have all of it. There are 1,033 parking spaces inside the library garage currently. I do not have the number that are currently contracted out. Can that um, be sent I to can, us before tomorrow night? I can get that. Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Council Lady Gilmore. I wanted to know how we decide to come up with the, the use of the library. And the only reason I ask that is because it's supposed to be for the public, and it seems like it's always in overflow now. So what would the patrons do? The regular citizens there are certain spaces that are held open for them they have marked spots and the garage always keeps a certain number of spots open for the citizens to come in they, they don't they don't ever completely fill this with with people who are doing monthly rates or the businesses that have contracted to do that is this the same one that the hotel shares with the library this is the same garage yes it is okay um, thank you so much Mr. Chairman, if I may, I would say I cannot support this legislation because anytime, if, if um, you go down to the library now, it's very hard for citizens to, to get in there. And we already waive it for like uh, 30 mi minutes. And in addition to that, the workers at the library are not even able to get their um, parking paid for. Okay. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, and Council Lady Dowell? I just had a, another question. Yeah. Are they adding sure. to the garage at the library currently? Will it? Yes, they are. They're adding uh, three additional levels, and I don't have the number of parking spots on me right now that that will add, but it's going to be additional three levels onto the current four levels. Now, are those three levels designated for um, any particular entity? Or are they going to be part of the library parking garage? They're going to be part of the library parking garage. They have not been designated for any entity at this point. Do you know how many parking spaces the patrons will lose with you um, assessing or setting aside these 35 spaces? Is it just going to be 35 less spaces for library patrons, or is it are these spaces being reallocated that's already been designated for some other use? No, it's, it's not been designated, and the 35 spaces will be theirs to come in and use whenever they need to, but they will not absolutely be held. So library patrons can come in and use any available space that's in the garage, but the garage does put a limit when they start to get full. Okay, I'm not sure I understood that. So are the 35 spaces going to be marked specifically for Warner Music? No, they will not. Okay, so anyone who comes in to that garage can utilize those spaces. They'll just be 35 spaces allocated for a fee that they can use in the garage. Right. So when the garage starts to fill up, they'll, they'll look at it and they'll say, okay, for Warner Music, we said we'd have 35, and they may hold 80% of those spaces available for Warner Music if the Warner people are not already in there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Council Lady Weiner, one moment. There thank you, are. Chair. Uh, Sharon, can you tell us when that construction of those three levels will be completed? I had an email on that the other day, and in all honesty, I cannot tell you. I'm thinking that it is, it's a year from now or better. So, Chair, it almost makes sense to me, since we're concerned about capacity and we're concerned about our constituents not being able to find a place to park there, um, especially on peak times. I'm not, and, and I'm kind of toying in my head with asking that we defer this until we know, A, when the parking garage will be completed, and B, if we have that capacity, do we want to then look at having the inception of this contract begin when the additional parking spaces are available. I mean, I could go either way on it. If, if we're guaranteed that our constituents are not going to have an issue, then I'm fine moving ahead with it. But it just seems like maybe we ought to look at that as an option. I don't know. 
Well, would you like to hear more of the discussion? I would. Prior yeah, to making, I definitely would. Prior sure. To making the Thank motion. you. Um, Councilman Glover. Hang on one second. This is a little, there we are. Thank you, Chair. I guess for me, what I would like to know is, what, do we have a capacity study on this? Do we know how frequently uh, it is at full capacity uh, throughout the, the course of the month? And so, I mean, can anybody answer that question? The Downtown Partnership isn't here tonight, and I'm sure that they'd be able to answer all of those questions. But if you will uh, let me take notes on the questions, I'll be sure and try to get them to you before Council tomorrow night. Okay. I, I think my largest question, Chair, is, what, what is the occupancy rate? And, and, you know, is there particular times of a month, is there particular times of a year uh, that it would put a greater strain on the patrons of the library? Uh, or will these 35 really not have that much of a, I guess, a substantial impact on anybody being able to use the, the library facilities? So uh, that, that's, for me, kind of critical. Uh, and if we could get that for tomorrow night, if, if we don't know the answers, then perhaps the sponsor would consider deferring for a meeting until we can get those answers. Thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Allen. One second. There we Thank go. you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm trying to remember my geography downtown. We just built a new MDHA garage that's not very far away from this. I'm thinking, is that is that a potential interim spot to use those parking places until the library is complete? I don't know. Public Works is responsible for the contract on the library garage and the courthouse garage, so I don't I don't have any information on the MDHA. Gotcha. Um, and I'm not, I guess that would take an intergovernmental agreement to make happen if we decided that was necessary. Second question is when when is Warner Music moving in? Is that imminent? I mean, they're they're still under construction as well, aren't they? Um. My understanding is that they still are under construction. At first, they had put in for more parking spaces than just the 35, and now they're just requesting the 35 because they have a limited staff that's coming into town. Do they have a start date for that? That I don't know. That's the downtown partnership. So that would the, be 35, the 35 is now. If it passes council, they'll go ahead and pay for the 35 now. Like starting July 1? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, it, 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 it seems worth exploring. I mean, we've got other parking spaces that we'd love to have a, a paying customer for if, if there's an issue with the with the capacity and the overflow, maybe to try to get those questions answered. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Lady. Uh, I had a question myself, Sharon, thank you for being here for John Cooper. Why does this have to be an ordinance? Why wouldn't Warner just go to the uh, parking manager or the downtown partnership itself and work out a, a private agreement? This, this garage was owned by Metro, and Public Works has the authority over that garage to contract with the downtown partnership. Um, everything that happens through these garages and with the parking meters goes through the Traffic and Parking Commission. So it will also hit the Traffic and Parking and Transportation Committee tomorrow night. So by, by ordinance and because this is, this is the way that, that this was set up, that the garages would run and how this would go through. Uh, thank you. Um, getting uh, other people in the discussion, Council Lady Henderson. Hang on one second. Um, my apologies. Um, there we are. Great. Thank you. Thank Madam you, Balky. Chair. Um, I wanted to ask Ms. Wallstrom, if I may, what is the fee that Warner Music is going to be paying per parking space? It will be the monthly rate, which is currently $135 a month. Okay, so they're not paying any extra to get the benefit of having those for them. They're just paying the same As rate that anyone else would correct, pay. Correct, for a monthly parker. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, Um, it's a little bulky here. Let me, um, other people, the machine is signing for being on the queue. Council Lady Gilmore, did you have more comments? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. I would just say, I think it warrants um, further discussion. If you've ever been down there during the day and you see the mothers with their kids, most of the time there are yellow signs that goes up, and there's usually a gentleman that's saying the parking is full at that point. And I just think we, at some point we have to think about our citizens, and I know a lot of different organizations and companies already use that 
parking lot now? And maybe if we can look at to the future, and I think there were some very good questions and very dis uh, good discussion as to what is the capacity, when will the um, current parking lot that's being renovated be completed? I just think we need to look at all those things because it is very difficult um, to, to, to park down there now, and I'm not being a negative Nancy. Right. Um, running through the queue, um, Councilman Glover. Move to defer one meeting. Motion to defer one meeting. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Uh, any, I, I'll run down the queue if anybody, to, for people to speak on the motion that has been made and seconded. Council, starting from the top, Council Lady Gilmore, you've made your comments. All right. Uh, Councilman Glover's made his motion. Council Lady Wiener. Council Lady Wiener, I'm just uh, running down the queue. Uh, for comments on the motion uh, to defer? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, Council Lady Dowell? Yes, I agree with it. Uh, okay, comments on the motion. And then Council Lady Murphy? I think before, um, while I'm in favor of deferring this, it'd be nice to get more information on these parking lots altogether. How many spots are, if there's a certain amount of spots that are allowed for the permit parkers per month, like the monthly parkers, and just overall some of these numbers to help us make a decision when this comes back before us would be helpful for, for us to have. Thank you. And Councilman Pridemore. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to, we need to be clear on what we're deferring it for. I mean, at this point, we're deferring it, but what, what information are we seeking here? Um, so. uh, Council Lady Weiner. Um, I think it would be important for us to know if the library is getting complaints, and so I think that we need to ask them to weigh in as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, and Council Lady Allen. And I think the other information would be, is, is the MDHA parking lot available for the interim period? Okay. And it looks like it's the same distance from City Center, which I think is where they're going to be, so that seems like a good, a good thing to explore. Okay. We'd worked our way down. All right, Council Lady Dowell, hang on one second. Um, no, um, Councilman Gilmore, let's, there we are. Yeah, thank you. And I think we want to see what all um, different companies, organizations are using the, the library now, what, okay. how they've been allocated amongst the groups that use them now. Okay, and Council Lady Mina Johnson. Thank you for uh, entertaining my question. I'm just curious, since you are asking uh, all the questions uh, between the now and deferral, I would like to ask for the extent of the contract, because the garage is managed by a parking company. So the monthly fees, are how much are we getting, or everything goes to the uh, parking garage company and so forth, I do not know the extent of the contract. So if you can provide all this uh, information, that would be greatly helpful as well. To add that to the questions. Uh, thank you. And then Council Lady Henderson. Last speaker. Uh, thank you, Chair Cooper. I support the deferral, but I, I wanted to bring the Council's attention to um, the MPO has done a parking study um, for downtown Nashville. And I think our Mr. Curl has as well done some um, parking analysis as to how many spaces are in what building and managed by whom. Um, but I would also be interested to know um, when we are uh, conferring um, municipal parking benefits and balancing and recognizing that um, access to parking generates traffic um, for corporations and so forth participating in that. Um, does Warner Music participate in our MTA Easy Ride program? Okay. Thank you. Thank that you. would be my question. Okay. We will, uh, hopefully we're keeping... Good track of the questions. Um, Council Lady Dowell on the but, motion to defer. Uh, yes. I was The last question that we asked uh, for them to let us know about is when the uh, garage completion would be made. Like, when are they going to complete that level on the garage? Okay. And, um, and, and, who, and is that parking space allocated to the library, or do we have any other agreements that is going to designate who takes those other three levels? Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Council Lady Gilmore. Thank you. I just wanted to see if Mr. Curl did have some insight. Council Member uh, Henderson alluded to he may have some information as it relates to this. Okay. He's uh, not at this time. Not at this time. Okay. And then Council Lady Allen. 
Thank you. I just want to point out, I had asked uh, Steve Bland and Eric Byer that very question yesterday when I saw this, and they're in the audience, if they, if it would be appropriate to ask them to address that question about the easy ride passes now, I think they're willing to. Um, okay, great. Thank um, you. The specific question about the easy ride passes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Eric Beyer with the uh, National MTA, and I um, help assist and oversee the Easy Ride program. Uh, yes, um, working with Matt Wilshire, that he has engaged them in that conversation, and they want to pursue that further, so it's a matter of us getting together, but that is something on their radar as far as with all businesses, and I'll make a quick commercial for that. It's a partnership where uh, there are tax implications or benefits um, for those that participate in some type of public transit, be it Vanpool, or Music City Star or the MTA or RTA services where they can uh, save money um, at the bottom line of their taxes, especially businesses and individuals as well. So always happy to share with any context that you all have in pursuing that program further. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, the a robust discussion. Um, if you didn't mind, Council Lady Wiener, Councilman Glover, I believe you made the motion to defer. How long is the deferral? One meeting, all right. So the motion made and seconded, one meeting deferral, robust discussion. All in favor of a one meeting deferral, please say aye. aye. All opposed, 744 is recommended for deferral for one meeting. Bill number BL 2017-746, uh, Council Lady Dowell, Cooper and others, uh, approves an agreement between Metro Public Works and Century Farms LLC for the design and construction of access roads connecting Cane Ridge Road and Old Franklin Road to the I-24 interchange at Hickory Hollow Parkway. There is a late amendment. Is there a motion? Move. Move. Moved and second the amendment. And then um, discussion uh, on the amendment. Seeing no one in the queue, uh, all in favor of 746, please say aye. Uh, of the amendment for 746. Now, is there a motion on 746 itself? Moved. Moved and seconded. Seeing no one in the queue for discussion on 746 itself, uh, please say aye. aye. All opposed, 746 is recommended to the council. Bill number BL 2017-747, Council Lady Dowell, Cooper and others as sponsors, authorizes the acquisition of certain right-of-way easements, drainage easements, temporary construction easements, and property rights for use in public projects for purposes of the Cane Ridge Road, Old Franklin Road, Preston Road, and Cane Ridge Parkway roadway improvements. Is there a motion? A motion and a second. And then I had a, myself, seeing no one in the queue, a quick question for finance. Um, this is the... Um, same bill that was included in the capital spending plan that was approved a few days ago. This is the authorization. Yes, that's my understanding. So we've already approved the money. Um, the money is slightly different, I noticed, at $12 million as opposed to $11 million. Did we appropriate the right amount of money last week? Yes, we did. There we did. Great. Okay. Thank you. The motion made and seconded. Uh, seeing no one in the queue, all in favor of 747, please say aye. 747 is recommended to the council. Bill 2017-748, Council Lady Van Rees, Pardue and others as sponsors, approves a lease agreement between Metro Due West Towers LLC for temporary office space at 610 Due West Avenue. Is there a motion? Motion made and second. Council Lady Van Rees. Uh, yes, I'm happy to answer any questions regarding this, but it's uh, basically uh, allowing the Sheriff's Department uh, temporary office space at the Due West Towers, um, that's the old Memorial Hospital site, um, for a handful of floors in one of the towers and uh, some parking behind. Um, I we're expecting about 200 employees in the area, and on behalf of the uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, we support this, and I hope you will as well. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, seeing no one else in the queue, um, the motion having been made and seconded, all in favor of 748, please say aye. 748 is recommended to the council. Uh, bills on third reading, Bill 2017-722 approves the budget ordinance for the Metropolitan Government of uh, Fiscal Year 2018. Uh, there are, I believe, eight amendments in your amendments package. If um, we should handle the amendments first. We should have the substitute. We should have the substitute. 
first. Um, so to, to approve the substitute. Okay. Is there a motion for the substitute? Move the substitute. Move the substitute. A second. All in favor? Okay. And then our discussion, Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Chair Cooper. Um, just as a point of order, I wanted to request as we move through these amendments because they are not all numbered, <laughs> if you could please as chair very distinctly describe and some of the amendments are similar, if you could just make sure that everyone on the committee is on the same page as to what amendment on which we're speaking. Uh, I'd appreciate it. Excellent point. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Glover. Mr. Jameson, I just want to clarify here. The amendments are, we're amending now the substitute, correct? Correct. All right, so now everything is moved into the council's bill, and whatever we amend here, we'll, we'll then come back and move the substitute as amended? Correct. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Councilman Mendez. I just want to make sure that I thought I heard you say all in favor after. Well, the we didn't get there. <laughs> Good. Because we, we need to talk about the amendments um, first. And we are going um, on to the amendments. Cool. Now. So we are moving on to the amendments of the bill that's been moved. Um, and thank you, Council Lady Henderson, for I'll, I'll try to be distinct and please um, correct me. We're, let's call Amendment 1 the amendment proposed by Councilman Elrod um, in the first page of the amendments section. Um, and I'll, I'll read just a, uh, a few of the whereases. Um, uh, in, uh, um, whereas uh, six, hmm? we'll, we'll read the last paragraph, okay. Therefore, I move to amend 722 as substituted at section one, schedule B, by increasing the departmental total for the codes administration from 10664000 to $11,112,000 for a net total addition of $447,600. Um, that is amendment number one proposed by Councilman Elrod and discussion. I see Councilman Mendez, are you from the previous discussion? No, it was this. It's left over, all right? No, it's on this. Oh, it's on this, Councilman Mendez? <laughs> Thanks, I, I was just uh, gonna ask, um, I don't know who the right person is for this, maybe the sponsor. Typically, we've seen uh, funding sources listed and I don't see one here, so I'm, I'm not sure what the intent is on that. Uh, Councilman Elrod, sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this just came from the working session uh, from last week that uh, during uh, Director Cobb's comments, uh, he was asked what would be the number one priority, basically, if he had more funding. And these were the positions that he asked for. Um, and I just included, I'm going to ask to withdraw it uh, because I don't have a funding source. However, um, I guess in theory, my second amendment could potentially fund it. Um, but that just to make a point that while I have uh, concerns that there are not enough property standards uh, inspectors, uh, zoning inspectors, that these positions go directly to health and safety for current buildings and for ones that are being built. And while we get calls on ones for property standards, for zoning inspections or z and that kind of thing, that we're not going to get calls from builders and developers of, hey, come investigate our gas lines um, for longer. As Director Cobb said that they're spending five minutes when they may need to spend 15 or 20 at least on a site. And they're about running behind on investigating uh, sites and buildings. So uh, going forward to the next uh, budget, uh, I would like for these to be considered because uh, these go directly to our building boom and handling it and making sure that the buildings that are being built aren't just being thrown up, that we're having the proper inspections according to the different codes for the different industries. So I would uh, ask that it be withdrawn. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Um, Councilman Glover, did you? To. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chair, if you would, I mean, I think in the substitute, I think we all tried to read it over the weekend and understand it. You did put in two of the inspector positions, correct? In the substitute? Substitute does add two additional uh, positions beyond the increase that is coming to That case. will fall under the inspection category. In the mechanical, however, yeah. However. Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, um, Councilman Elrod, last word. Okay, all right. Uh, with his, uh, the councilman's motion to withdraw, we will withdraw amendment one. 
and move on to Amendment 2. Also, Councilman Ed Elrod as the sponsor. Um, fees charged and imposed by departments of Metro are required by state law to be set to only recover costs for the services in which these fees are charged and imposed. Therefore, all funds from fees charged or imposed by any department of Metro government shall remain with the department that is charging or imposing the fee to cover the department's cost. The department is authorized to hire additional employees or contract for services to reach or maintain an appropriate level of customer service to the general public. For any services it charges or imposes a fee, the department may transfer funds collected from fees to the general fund if it is providing an appropriate level of customer service to the general public. Uh, Councilman Elrod. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this uh, comes about because of uh, learning about the fee income that comes from Public Works, the right-of-way operating permit, or excuse me, the right-of-way closure fees and excavation fees um, are actually brings in more than what we're spending on staffing and expenses in Public Works. The same is going on in the codes department that we're bringing in millions of dollars more than what we're using or than what we're um, paying and employing staff and expenses and that kind of thing. And in both public works and codes, and I'm not sure about other departments of metro government, we don't have enough staffing, um, I think in the opinion of many. And for public works, in my opinion, we do not have enough staffing um, and enough uh, manpower and resources to handle the boom that we're seeing and the right-of-way closures uh, in downtown or other parts of the city. So what this resolution would do, or excuse me, what this amendment would do is just empower the departments to that they are allowed to keep those fees or that fee income and hire the appropriate employees or to uh, contract or enter into contracts for services to meet those demands however and it would empower them but they're still um, able to give that money those monies to the general fund but we have a i believe through our growth that metro government in the critical areas of it's public works and perhaps others we have fees that are supposed to be charged that are supposed to be collected to handle the services that those fees are imposed for so I'm asking this re amendment um, be adopted I don't ask for a, a vote um, because that otherwise we're making money off of these departments and not hiring the staff of what these fees are there for so I would uh, ask for it to be approved thank you Good ask for it to be approved. Uh, councilman Pridemore Thanks, Chair. And how I, I appreciate my colleague and what he's trying to, attempting to do here, but the language being that each department may uh, keep the money or may put it back in the if I put it into the general fund. I mean, that makes there's a lot of discretion there upon the depart the director of the department. But also, there's a you know, I would like for maybe uh, administration to just uh, give us an idea of departments that don't generate revenue and how, it, I mean, they deal with, they utilize the money from uh, these funds. And so I'm wondering just how it would affect them, but also, again, back to, I reiterate the fact, you're leaving it up to the a director of, uh, of, a, of a department to determine whether he's, he or she is willing to keep the funds uh, that they generate. Uh, that's a lot of responsibility on how the city is run as far as paying its debt. So I'll def refer that to uh, the administration table. Um, I agree there, there would be a lot of discretion. Um, the biggest issue I see is that you would have a budget that isn't balanced because you have the revenue and then the expenditures on the other side and those have to balance. And in this case, if a department got to keep and operate off of its own revenue exclusively, that means that some other departments would have to be reduced in the budget to offset that. So um, that would need to be part of the substitute if, if um, the amendment passes. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. And again, I understand what uh, my colleague's attempting to do. It's just, I don't, I don't, we've just got to find a different way of doing it, I guess. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Jamison, uh, help me, for those of us who are not attorneys, help me understand, or Director Cooper, either one of you, help me understand the way that the state law is written here, that we can collect the fees, 
it sounds like, as I'm listening to this, only enough to pay for uh, what expenses are generated, but obviously we're not doing that. We're going over and above in certain departments. That, that is correct, but state law requires the fees that are generated or charged by a department to be set at the amount necessary to replace the costs of implementing whatever you're regulating. And if you go above and beyond that, it's deemed a tax, and because we only have certain limited areas in which we can assess a tax, property tax, for example. If we go beyond that by assessing too high a fee, we're not allowed to do that under state law. So I, I understand the frustration, but this would not only cause an imbalance, but some other practical concerns would be departments that otherwise see the additional funds go to the general fund would not be motivated at all to tell you that they're exceeding the amount of their costs with the fees. And that would be uh, cause a, a reporting problem. Okay. I, I too, uh, appreciate what the sponsor is doing here. I, I think, I, I hope the administration, I'll look over to your table right now, I hope the administration is hearing what he's trying to do with this because the customer service in some of these departments is lousy, not because of them, but because we have not put the people, we have not kept up with the growth that we've done in the city. So I hope we listen loud and clear. And if we continue as we're going in the city, that we, we make sure it's front and center as we go forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady Weiner. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mike, is it possible for us to look at this issue moving forward at another time during the year? Do we have to address it right now during the budget ordinance? Uh, you don't have to address it right now, and you could look at it later. Okay, because while I agree with the, with the um, intent and understand where it's coming from. I think this is something that we may want to just take a harder look at moving forward, but right now is probably not the time to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Councilman Elrod. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the my colleagues' uh, reservations, but um, if I just, and I'm not on the budget committee, so I'm not privy to a lot of these discussions, uh, but I think I just heard that we can't let departments, some departments that impose these fees keep the money because other departments can't run. So that literally means that other departments are running off of public works fees, other departments other than public works. Other departments other than codes are running and being funded by fees raised by codes. I mean, if I'm wrong, please, please tell me. Uh, not necessarily because uh, departments have different fee structures. I think if you look at the public works budget, they don't bring in enough fees to cover their budget. Uh, and, and, and I would, the only additional caution I think I would uh, provide the Metro Council is that we are looking at one point in time in terms of revenue collections. If you were to pass something like this and codes was expected to be self-supporting and revenues dropped, then that department would have to reduce their budget likewise. So uh, if this had been in effect when the recession hit, you probably would have been seeing a 20 or 30% reduction in the codes budget. If, the, if they were supposed to be self, fully self-supporting based on the fees that they collect. But at that time, they did have some incremental budget reductions, but it was not as severe as the revenue losses that we were seeing at that time. And the general fund made up for those differences, so it would not be as big of an impact on that department. Uh, um, I've got it in my email. I, I, I apologize for not having the numbers, but the excavation fees and the right-of-way permit fees, I, I want to say you're bringing like, like $3.2 together, but that's not the amount that we are spending on the right-of-way division um, of public work. So that's just one example. Um, so, uh, Councilman, um, all right. Um, on Amendment 2, seeing no one else in the queue, uh, for 722, all in favor of Amendment 2, please say aye. All opposed? 722 is uh, not recommended added to the substitute. Amendment number three, um, Councilman Glover as the sponsor. Um, amendment three, Councilman Glover moves to amend 722 as substituted as follows. 
One, by increasing the departmental total of the codes administration from 10,664,000 to 10,783,000 for a net total addition of 118,000 for two zoning examiners. And the source is by decreasing the departmental total of the MTA subsidy from 48,635,000 to 48,515,000 for a total net deduction of the same amount, $118,000. Um, is there a motion? Move. Motion made and seconded. Um, any discussion? Councilman Mendez? Uh, for the sponsor, just uh, curious about the choice of the funding source and whether there's been a conversation between he and MTA. And I thought I saw Mr. Bland walk into the building. I'm not sure whether he wishes to comment on it. And I'm just, just curious about that. Um, here's Mr. Bland. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I missed the question. You sure. want to? I just, for me, the one of you, uh, the sponsor, Mr. Bland, just whether there's been a discussion about the funding source and whether MTA has any objection to it or not. Uh, well, obviously, <laughs> if I say there's no objection, there's going to be more. Um, when we put forward our original budget proposal, even in the mayor's office, it recognized a very aggressive growth in mass transit service, and even the mayor's office and finance couldn't honor all of those requests. So certainly there's a need for it, but as we talked about during the budget hearings, we also understand, you know, the other competing interests. So I can't tell you that it would, you know, cripple uh, the operation of the MTA. What it would likely do, obviously, we'd want to circle back with council uh, and the mayor's office on priorities, would um, cut back on what we were looking to do in a mobility on demand program in the upcoming year, which is essentially that first mile, last mile type of service uh, coming forward. It, but it wouldn't jeopardize, you know, present day service. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Lady Allen. Thank you. I think I want to follow up on that question. Just we had already emailed about the three hundred seventy-seven thousand seven hundred that's being taken away, and this would be another how many thousand on top of that? One hundred eighteen thousand on top of that. So does that totally wipe that out, or just dig a little deeper into the, it? Um, the tentative allocation we have toward mobility on demand of the overall increase that was proposed for MTA was about seven hundred thousand dollars. So. Okay with either or both of these, that would leave some. You know, it likely means we just try to start later in the year and have fewer um, demonstration okay. areas than we would have already, you know, we would have anticipated. Okay, I mean, I hate to but see again, that But again, that's subject to, that's sort of our initial staff review. You know, obviously, if there are other, um, you know, priorities, that would, that would be part of the conversation with our board and all those who are involved. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, and then Councilman Mendez, did you all this hang down? And then Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and let me answer Councilman Mendez, if I may. No, I did not have a conversation with this department simply because we didn't get the substitute budget until late Friday. Uh, and then when we had to file everything, there wasn't time to, to get in touch with them and, and, talk, and talk with them. In a very simplistic way, I think we all agree that if we can get, you know, give every department every dollar they want, that's fabulous. Uh, but at the end of the day, this one had a pretty pretty aggressive uh, increase in, in its funding. And I think everyone I've said, and I think uh, Councilman Elrod and, and some others are, are trying to look at ways at, at how do we uh, get into to the codes and especially the zoning examiners to where we cut down the wait time that, that our folks are having to wait uh, there. And I'm assured that these two positions uh, will help uh, drastically with that. So I, I, I took that funding source realizing that I don't believe, I think when I, and I don't want to speak on behalf of Director Bland, but uh, when we were talking about the transition, not paying for the, the second time, I mean, if maybe, and again, simplistic thinking, but if maybe that was delayed for a couple of weeks or maybe even a month before that happened, nobody's going to nobody's gonna think anything was taken away from them yet because it hadn't been enforced as of yet. So I felt like this was probably one of the easier areas to look in and, and grab it. And so that, that's the reason that I, uh, I looked at that particular funding source. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, 
Councilman Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, when I saw the amendment, I, I did a little check-in with uh, the zoning administrator myself, and uh, yeah, this is, is difficult uh, for me because uh, I very much respect what Mr. Bland has going on, but when you look at what's happening over there at the uh, zoning office, uh, we basically have a shop that opens up at 7.30 in the morning and closes at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if anybody else really uh, uh, would want to do business like that because uh, if you aren't in that line before that time limit, then uh, you're shut down. And then uh, uh, basically uh, when other metro offices close up for the day uh, early for whatever reason, the zoning uh, uh, inspectors or what do you call them, zoning examiners, they can't go because they've got to serve all the people that are sitting in line. So we, they've really got an issue over there. In addition to that, uh, 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 Mr. Herbert's got two senior guys, one with 23 years service and one with 33 years, uh, uh, both of whom will be eligible to retire, and uh, the next senior man has two years of uh, experience over there. So uh, I think uh, the, uh, the mood over there is uh, more toward desperation. So, uh, uh, you know, we have to make tough choices in these budgets. So uh, uh, considering uh, what's going on over at the, the zoning examiner's office, I'm going to uh, uh, weigh in in support of this amendment uh, uh, to add two more positions there. Thank Th you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilor Henderson. Uh, thank you, Chair Cooper. I, I concur with what uh, Councilman Pulley said. I, I felt in our, our budget work sessions there was really good general consensus around the table that those zoning examiner zoning examiner positions um, were were needed. Um, it does pain me, though, to uh, pull the funding from M MTA. Um, uh, I appreciate my colleague, Mr. Glover, addressing this. I think if I had addressed it myself by amendment, I probably would have pulled from elsewhere. So um, that said, um, I think the need for these zoning examiners is acute. Um, Mr. Bland, could you speak just in a little more detail? So it's a differential to you of 120k and so basically you're saying that mobility on demand or otherwise expansion of services you would just delay some service expansions or changes such yeah. that it, to Mr. Glover's point yeah, you wouldn't I, be taking something I think something actually away. Um, Councilman Glover hit the nail on the head it's much easier to cut back on something nobody has yet than it is on something that people rely on every day so it was going to take us some period during the startup of the fiscal year to actually get that program up and running anyway. And again, you know, without specific discussions with individual council people or the mayor's office or our board, but that's the easiest place to pull this from as opposed to saying, well, we're going to delay, you know, the reinstitution of free transfers or the um, North Nashville improvements or what have you that, you know, that were also included in the budget. But we would that. still intend to try to move forward with it just at a slower and smaller scale. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Council Lady Weiner. Without belaboring the point, I think our priorities need to be in constituent services, and this zoning department is clearly stretched to its maximum. And when you think in terms of the need to do effective staff planning so you don't burn out your already burned out employees, and offer time for recruiting, onboarding, hiring, and training. I, I just think that, that it makes perfect sense to, to do this, and I fully support it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council Lady. Uh, seeing no one else in the queue uh, for Amendment 3, Councilman Glover's Amendment to 722. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Uh, 722, Amendment 3 is uh, uh, recommended to the a substitute amendment four introduced by councilman mendez um, amending 722 by increasing the amount for subsidy hospital authority by five million dollars from 35 to 40 million dollars and by reducing the amount for the item entitled reserve for new debt by five million dollars is there a motion motion made and seconded um, councilman mendez Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as a, as a group over the last 18 months, we've had lots and lots and lots of conversations with the hospital authority and about the hospital authority, so I, I, I won't uh, belabor the need. Um, this 
is a, a large amount, um, and I want to discuss the source. Um, this is uh, uh, an item that hasn't been in the budget previously. It's setting aside money for future debt service that, that isn't going to exist in fiscal uh, 2018. So this isn't money that has been planned to be spent in fiscal 18. It's not taking any money away from anything that needs to be paid in fiscal 18. It's it, the, the idea of the source was to build into the budget for future years increases in debt amounts that we'll, we'll have and we know about. Um, that is, uh, I think, as all you know, I have been, uh, uh, since I've been in office, argued hard for paying more attention to our debt and debt service and having more transparency on it. So we, this isn't a source I go to easily. I've picked it because it's it's large. It was 11.4 million set aside in the budget. So this will decrease it to 6.4, and it doesn't impact anything due in fiscal 18. Um, when I make the choice, uh, the balance between um, money that's being set aside for future years and not for the next fiscal year versus the urgent need for the hospital to take care of um, uh, our citizens. Um, it's an easy choice for me to want to fund this. Um, I know that uh, some will feel like this doesn't really cover the full need for the hospital for the year, so, so what's the point? Um, of uh, a partial solution, and uh, my response to that would be um, that uh, we need to provide some more, um, what I'd call runway, some, some room for the hospital to figure out what they're going to do. I think that unlike previous versions of the hospital authority, that uh, uh, for lack of a better description, maybe simply ignored the appropriation, um, ran the hospital the way uh, it needed, it, it, however it was being run, and then came back for more money. I believe this version of the hospital authority um, with the new members we approved eight months ago is going to take the $35 million seriously. I think there's a serious risk of an immediate uh, cutback on services at the hospital, which I think would be bad for Nashville. And that's uh, the reason for the proposed amendment. And uh, again, the funding source doesn't take any money out of any bucket that needs to be spent in fiscal 18. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Weiner. I just need to recuse myself, please. Thank you, Council Lady. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. While I understand that we're not, quote, taking money that's going to be spent in 18, I also think that the $5 million may not be enough. Uh, and so uh, with that, I'm going to call on uh, uh, Director Lomax real quick. The, if I remember correctly, there's $11 million that's built in to help pay debt service in the, in the next budget year that basically we're putting into, quote, the savings account, right? Yes. Okay. So if we, if this happened, what we're doing is we would be taking the money away from what we already know is going to be an increase. I mean, I did some rough calculations, and I think based upon the 3% that's already been told employees are going to have, based upon the debt service, based upon the new police officers, based on new things that are in this budget that we will probably pass tomorrow, we're going to about have about 71 to uh, 75, maybe $80 million in new money that we're going to spend next year uh, over and above what this is. And so I'm very hesitant to start hitting reserve funds because aren't we already taking money out of reserve funds to operate this this current the budget this this proposed yes we are okay so uh what's going to happen and so i guess my question again is back to the finance department we've already been told by the hospital authority and i agree that the the, the board is is operating uh much more efficiently hopefully now than than it was but what's going to happen to They've told us, I think in November, they're not going to be able to make payroll starting again in November with just the 35. Am I remembering that correctly? My, my understanding is that um, they have indicated that they would come back in November assuming that they were operating off of a $55 million allocation. I think that that's what I heard in terms of the presentation is that they would continue as if they were operating based on that need that was identified. So I think the message back to them would be 35 million 
is your number if that turns out to be the final number or whatever the final number is, if it's 40 or whatever. Um, the only thing that I, I think I'd like to add to, um, to uh, this conversation in terms of this amendment, one has to do with the amount that we have reserved for the new debt. You will notice in the budget ordinance as filed that that amount, there's a footnote on there that that, saying that that is contingent on actual revenue collections. Okay, so the intent was that should revenue, collect, you know, because we wanted to make sure that we were very careful um, about that, that should the revenue estimates meet exactly where we need to be or exceed uh, our estimates, then we would take that and do the reserve for the new debt. So there was a contingency note based on that. And then the um, second thing that um, I think I just would want to mention is that um, this would impact uh, future capital spending plans because it would make us have to look then at any recommendations coming forward in terms of uh, any new capital spending beyond what was just approved by the Metro Council. So those are the two things that I think would have um, um, the most immediate impact or things that you all would need to take into consideration as you consider this amendment. Okay, so if I may, I'm, I'm gonna kind of walk folks back that maybe weren't here. Um, when eight, when the, when the crash started hitting in eight and we began looking in August, uh, of the year, but realizing the budget had just passed uh, six weeks earlier, we began looking at the, and I was chairing budget and finance for schools at that time. At August, I forecasted that we were gonna lose, we were gonna be short $5 million for the school budget in that operating year. By November, Mr. Riebling, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I think we were then forecasting somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 10 to 12 million shortage, or maybe it was Jan by January. But so in a very short amount of time, sales tax revenues really took a nosedive. And so what you're saying, if I'm, if I'm translating correctly, Director, is that same thing happens here, that 11 million may not be there, so we may be unintentionally hitting reserve funds uh, well, I even I, I, heavier. I don't, I don't wanna leave any impression that we don't think those revenue estimates are gonna be met. Right. But we did put that in there just as a contingency. Well, uh, and, I, and just let me- in case, just to, because we are very careful with our revenue estimates, very, very careful. Right, no, and, and I appreciate that, but but we felt when, when, when the economy took a nosedive back then, we felt like the numbers were conservative at that point also, it was just things out of our control. So I'm, I'm while I appreciate the intention, uh, I'm, I have a feeling they're gonna be coming back anyway uh, to talk to us. I'm just very leery to, to go ahead and hit reserve funds for this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanna say, I, um, I, I'm very supportive, I guess one, as the chair of the Health and Hospital Authority, and then the second piece is, I think that this board, and along with the CEO, and this uh, interim CFO, they are really on the right track, and they have um, done done the due diligence, and I just really think that this is a good, a good deal, and that this five million, I'm, I'm listening to the logic of the the hospital authority would still come back. Well, I've been on on the uh, council for the last nine years, and I think it's never been properly funded, and we say that over and over, but it seems not to make uh, any difference. And then the second piece is, I was here last week when uh, Council Member Mendez offered up three different ways to um, fund it, and council members shared that they would support it, but just not in this way. So. I would just ask at this point, I think if you're gonna support it, you just are, and if you're not, and I would ask that those council members support it, because there's only a couple of different ways that you can do it. So last week we looked at increasing the overall budget, which administration said they supported that, and then we had the opportunity as a council to allocate those funds, but the council members voted no in the committee for that. And then the second piece was he had offered up, uh, taking a certain percentage, was it from the, I can't remember. I try to write it down, but and then we we looked at the capital spending plan. But but the point is, um, every way that we've tried, the, the council members have said no. And then the, the third piece is, we also uh, just to kind of speak to what uh, Council Member Glover shared. We did have a downturn in 08, but I think it's just what you're committed to. And I think as a city, we just need to say that we are committed to making sure that poor people in our city have access to health because we also funded. Uh, the Music City Center during the downturn of the economy. That was a very ambitious project, and we did that. And so I wish we would show the same uh, compassion um, and same uh, um, 
I guess, same enthusiasm um, for the hospital authority as well. And, and that's all I have to say. So I would ask council members to support it. I think the revenues are going to come in. Every day you hear that Nashville has the most construction and the most people moving to the city. I think right now we have the most construction of any uh, um, other state in the United States right now. So I'm not really, I'm not worried about revenues. I think that they, they will come in. Thank you. Thank you, council lady. Councilman uh, Hager. Hang on one second. It's a little balky. Now you are, yes. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask Director uh, Lomax, I know we had discussions um, earlier, and the biggest problem about the revenue with General Hospital was filing their claims on time. And I guess my question to her is, does she still have somebody in finance working with them, as she did a while back, as I recall? Well, we, we continue to have uh, weekly conversations with them, but, uh, I mean, we are not into their day-to-day -day operations. We just kind of check in to see how things are going. And I can't remember, did they say they had hired some more people to turn in the claims, or did they not? Are still working? I think she reported that to you all in the working committee, that she had hired a couple of staff members. Are they okay. here today? Okay. It'd be better if they took that question. All uh, right. Are they here? Uh, yes. Mark. Thank you. Yes, Mark Oberlock with uh, General Hospital. Yes, our uh, interim chief financial officer has hired two revenue cycle uh, executives uh, who've come in and really hit the ground running. So how, how many do you have now that are turning in the claims? Because you've got 90 days to turn those in, am I correct? Uh, most contracts are 120 days, um, so, but 90 days, 100, 120 days. So, so you have you got three now or one? Because at one time you only had one. So, it, well, we, if we only had one, now we've got two more, so we've got three. That's uh, what I'm asking. They're all working together, yes. Okay. And whatever became of the money that they lost to the 10 care, what happened to those negotiations? Did so I think those negotiations are ongoing, Councilman. And uh, as Judy Peak Lee had mentioned, we moved from zero to two million off of the six. Okay. So you've collected two million or not? Correct. Yes. Okay. So uh, we're still short about $4 million, is that correct? That's correct. Is that with TenCare or other providers? I believe it's mostly TenCare, but don't hold me to it. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Allen. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to go back to the, the balance between trying to help General, which is clearly an important need, and making sure that we're being responsible with regard to our, our debt service. So I think, Director O'Neill, this is a... For you, it, it, my understanding is that, that our, our debt service has been around 190 to 200 million for the past couple of years and that we're expecting it to be significantly higher than that this year. What, 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 what is it budgeted for this year? I don't have that number uh, right in front of me in terms of the actual increases by year, but that was included, all of that was included in the treasurer's report. Mm -hmm. And um, what we've uh, estimated for the debt service increase for fiscal year 19 is about the $11 million. And we decided because we've got another uh, increase hitting in the following year, that it would be best to go ahead and set aside a reserve for the following year. And then when we get into that next year's budget, it would be less of an impact overall in terms of the uh, size of the increase gotcha. in that year's budget. So essentially it was an opportunity for us to look at this from a long-term strategic standpoint to make sure that we could somehow level off the debt payments and try to get ahead of the game. And I appreciate that conservative approach. So, um, and does that, does that bump include the, uh, the, ish, the bond issuance that we just okayed or would that go on top of that? Uh, that would go on top of that. This, in the treasurer's report, it showed you when those uh, new bond issuances were anticipated to mm -hmm. kick in. Okay, so that would add, that would add on top of that. Okay, then the next question is: I mean, our our part of the strategy was to be conservative at this time of the year, and then midway through the year, sort of see what the reality is in terms of of revenues. At that point, is it possible? since we've already given uh, general five million that we were thinking we would give to them later in the year that we could allocate five million back to this reserve 
Well, I, at that I can't point. make a commitment on that. I mean, we just need to look at. So I'm not asking a commitment, but would it be possible? I guess. Could you answer that one? Uh, just from a from a uh, kinda, yes yes we can do that or no yeah. we're not allowed by law. That's I guess that's the question I'm asking. Well, the capital the capital spend if we bring forward a capital spending plan that is for debt service. Right. Okay, that's going to have a debt service uh, impact. I think what's being proposed here is funding for their operating budget. Right. And so when we take up, so I don't think that those those are two different issues. Right. When we when we um, if we if we take five million from this eleven million dollar reserve, can we can we pump that back up again mid year or is this our only opportunity to put that money into that? Yeah, I, I really uh, think that. Um, I wouldn't really be in a position today to entertain a supplemental request mid-year. Okay. All right. That's helpful to know. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Council Lady Vircher. Thank you, Chair. I think it's without saying that um, we all want to support our hospital. Um, quick question. Um, the five million, um, they've already reported that they're going to have to cut services. So even with the additional five million, would they still be looking at cutting services? I, I guess I'm asking, what does the, the additional five million actually gain? That's a question for the hospital. Yes, Mark. I'm not sure I can actually answer that question without Judy Peakley here, uh, Council Lady. I know it from what she said uh, just in passing, it would reduce the stress uh, for budgeting and would reduce the number of potential cuts, but for what and which service lines, I cannot say. I know our board is considering uh, all options, so, and they will be meeting next week to take that up. I, I don't want to try and speak for them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. I want to come back to uh, Director O'Neill, please, very quickly, because I think what you just said, a little light went off for me. The, the money that is being set aside, it is line itemed for debt service specifically, correct? Yes, it is, in the, as filed with the mayor's budget. Right. And so, therefore, and, and uh, um, Chairman Cooper, you left it that way in the substitute, right? I, I did not, didn't bother to this check is, that, but I believe it was left that way, if I saw it correctly. The substitute. Okay. The same as the mayor's budget. Yes. And so, you know, while we approved a capital spending plan last week, we already know that debt service number is increasing. Uh, and so all we're doing is preparing. And so, yeah, we really would be hitting operation. I mean, we're, we're now kind of blending operational and uh, capital because these are capital projects that are already done. We already know the debt service is coming, correct? Okay. All right. And so, so with that, I, I really, uh, in Councilman Des, I, I think we're all trying to figure out a way to how do we do the funding. But we, in essence, have committed these dollars. Uh, and so, therefore, I won't be able to, to support this one. I think we're going to be coming back in November trying to figure out what do we do with this. But uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councilman. Councilman Mendez. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, a, a couple of things. Um, uh, Council Lady Vircher asked a question about what difference it makes. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm not on the hospital authority. I don't run the hospital. But um, if, if I were in their shoes, what the extra $5 million would be able to do is instead of making cuts um, to services this summer, it would put me in a position to say, to all the interested parties, whether that's Metro, um, other hospitals, uh, all the interested parties, um, we're going to have to make cuts in October or November and give um, some period of time for people to uh, uh, figure out what the, the right negotiation should be rather than just diving straight into cuts immediately. Um, in, in, to address the issue that Councilman Glover um, brought up, uh, I'll, by, by building this 11.4 into the budget um, this year, all that we really do is um, uh, make it so, let, let's imagine next year, we don't know whether the increase of the budget's gonna be 40 million, 
uh, 50 million, 100 million. Um, you know, we've been uh, blessed as a city to have 100 million dollar a year increases for the last two years. Um, Next year, if we don't increase, if we don't do this set aside of 11.4, we'll know that 11.4 million of next year's increase will have to go toward debt service. And so, by building it into the budget this year, um, we're sort of hedging as a city that in case next year's increase is 40 million instead of 120 million, um, that there will still be uh, money that things can be spent on. Um, and and I, I do think that's absolutely prudent. You know, if we end up with a $120 million organic increase in the budget next year, then having set aside the 11.4 built into the budget this year won't have been necessary. If we end up with a much smaller increase organically in the budget next year, then we'll really wish that we had set the, the money aside um, because it'll hurt uh, to suck up all the money for something as boring as debt service. Um, my uh, guess is that if I have to make a bet on when people's health is, are involved and supporting the hospitals involved, I'm willing to bet that we're probably going to have a pretty good increase again next year with all the buildings coming online. Um, this is only taking 45, 44% of the money that's getting set aside built in. So there's still a fair amount that uh, 6.4 million being set aside built into the budget going forward. And it's a, it's a, it's a fair balance, I think. Um, we definitely know that the increase is coming, but I think this is um, how we balance it. The, the one thing that I, I would leave, um, uh, I guess I want to ask uh, finance too. I, I've just been uh, skimming the ordinance. I, I don't see anywhere where the ordinance says that uh, that set aside is contingent on revenue. Can somebody point me to that? I've done a word search for um, reserve and contingent and uh, looked for asterisks. I'm looking at the council amendment package and it's on page 45 of that document, but um, I'm not sure the actual ordinance page. It's uh, when you get to the grand total of the general fund, general services district, that transferred to the debt service fund. I'll show, I'll, I'll walk over and show it to you. So it, it's not just the, the uh, 11.4 for new debt, it's the, your, this footnote is basically saying all the debt services subject to revenue? Yeah, but that was a really a special, that you won't find that in prior year budget ordinances, and it was because of the um, reserve that we set aside. All right, I got it. Um, I guess uh, then the last thing I was going to add is um, th this is, uh, you know, I, so there is an assumption being made that they're just going to come back um, for more. And uh, I'm here to tell you, and Mr. Overlock um, is, you know, got uh, obligations um, both to the hospital authority, so I'm not sure how willing, maybe I'm putting him on the spot, but uh, this this board is, is not going to act the same way as previous boards. Um, they're not just going to run until they run out of cash and come back. They are going to change fundamental operations at the hospital, and that's the conversation we're going to be having next, not um, that they ran out of money. And I ask you guys to consider that when we think about this amendment. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Vice Chair Vircher. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, let me let me state my my initial question. I believe it was um, restated incorrectly. I had a simple question as to whether, with the five million, would it prevent um, the announced uh, cuts and services of not? And they actually addressed that. None of us in this chamber can speak on behalf of what this board would do, what the CFO would do, or what the CEO would do. Um, for us to consider this, we need to make sure that we're actually benefiting them in a holistic manner. Um, if they're going to be coming back in November, um, we need to take that under consideration as well. Um, but we need to know uh, whether or not if the five million is it going to actually be be more beneficial now, or or will they be coming back in mid year asking for an, another five, six, seven million? I don't I don't know. None of us in here knows that. Um, this board they been um, been in place for about eight month eight eight months. 
And from my understanding is that uh, the administration is, has been working with them to see how everything goes, to give them an opportunity. No one in this chamber is saying that they're gonna operate like the prior board, but I think it's um, incumbent upon us to make sure that we're responsible with the city's dollars. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, seeing no one else in the queue, uh, Amendment 4, uh, the Mendez Amendment to 722. Uh, all in favor of this amendment, please say aye. aye. All opposed? No. Uh, show of hands, all in favor, raise your hand and aye. All right, um, and then all opposed, raise your hands. All right, the amendment um, fails, uh, and all right, please. All right. All right. Let's. Okay, everybody in fifth. Yeah. All in favor, say, uh, raise your hand high. Five. All right, so Leonardo, Allen, Pulley, Mendez, Gilmore. Uh, all opposed, please raise your hand. Pridemore, Henderson, Dowell, Roten, Bircher, and Five to six. Fails five to six. Now, one, one point, um, being somewhat new to this process, all amendments come before the council tomorrow night. All amendments come before the council tomorrow night, uh, regardless of how the committee has, has voted. Isn't this right? That's correct. Regardless of how the committee has voted, all amendments come back before the council tonight. So again, everyone be involved in the discussion and um, we will have that, that vote tomorrow night. Amendment five. BL 2017-722, uh, Council Lady Van Rees is the sponsor, moving to amend the ordinance, one, by decreasing the appropriation to the Contribute Andrew Jackson Foundation in the amount of $135,000, reducing the function from $135,000 to zero, two, by increasing the appropriation in Section 1, Schedule B, uh, social services in the amount of 135,000 with the increase to be allocated to the nonprofit organization 50 Forward Senior Citizens for Elderly Care Management and Meal Provisions. Is there a motion? Is there a motion? Moved. Is there a second? Um, second for the committee. Moved and seconded. Uh, our sponsor, Council Lady Van Rees. Thank you very much. I'm not on this committee, but I'm standing because this is extremely important. Um, I think that all of you know that I've worked very hard to try to find some money for 50 Forward in this budget. I know that several of you have. Um, I was disappointed when I did not see it in the amendment and uh, was forced to really look hard for something else. Uh, in that um, hunt and search, uh, I was able to find this particular appropriation um, to the Andrew Jackson Foundation. Um, I've asked um, to understand what that money goes for and have been told it's primarily marketing and um, also uh, some, uh, some work in regard to tourism. As the uh, head of the Conventions and Tourism Committee, I take that very seriously as well. Um, but I do think that in certain, 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 certain circumstances, particularly this one, uh, we have an obligation to our seniors, and um, I think that this is a good place to make that stand, um, and I'm happy to do so. I have um, the Janet Jernigan here to answer any of your questions, and uh, I hope that you will address them. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, Councilman Davis, Scott Davis. Thank you. I echo, too, the concerns that Council Lady Van Rees um, I too submitted an amendment for 50 forward and once again, you know, when she didn't see it in the budget, we both had submitted amendments before the deadline and got them in there. And I just want to thank Council A. Van Reach for her diligence. Um, my amendment asked for a little bit more money and I'm not taking it from the hermitage. I'm taking it from another source. 
uh, which the gentlemen from Donaldson and Hermitage areas will support it from the source I'm taking it from, but may or may not support it from the, from the Hermitage because Councilman Hager, that's where his, that's his district, and Councilman Roden, who is on the committee, half of the, 54 is in his district and the Hermitage is also, half of the land is in his district also. Both of them love and support 54. And I don't mean to speak for the two gentlemen on the floor, or I don't mean to speak for Council Lady Van Reese. We all want to help 54. But if there was a possibility, you know, I thank you Council Lady Van Reese for all your hard work, that I believe that the gentleman from Donaldson and Hermitage areas and some of the other folks will support the 50 forward if the money is taken from the sources in which I designated it for. You know, and I was looking at those sources, I mentioned them during our last work session, and I told Councilman Syracuse and a few others that I would do everything possible to support the 50 forward. I even got the caucus in our meeting to say that they will support in full motion and 50 forward together in order to move it forward. And I've done that. And so I am just asking that in case this amendment is moved or deferred or it's not accepted, that 50 forward and Council A. Van Reese do not lose hope because it's coming back in another amendment for more money. If that makes sense, Chair, I am sorry to ramble, but I'm just trying to make everybody happy. Thank you, Councilman. You're alerting people to that there's another amendment coming uh, yes, generally yes, on the subject. Thank you. Councilman Hager. I just want to speak to this real quick since the Hermitage is in my district. Um, I was not informed prior to this that this money was going to be taken from the Hermitage. Um, what people don't know about the Hermitage is it has over 300,000 visitors a year. It's the second most visited presidential home site in the United States. And when you're talking about over 300,000 people, you think about the amount that it feeds into the economy here in Nashville. The other side of this is, I'm a big supporter of 50 Ford. I'm a big supporter of Anque Station and, and council member of Van Treese's district. I've helped them all the time, including 50 Ford. But I ask, don't come into my district and take away money that is being used to help the economy of this city as well. And I applaud Councilman Davis for his amendment coming up. I'd ask that this be withdrawn or denied. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilor e. Weiner. I have a question I'm not sure I can ask because I'm looking at the funding sources. Clearly, I want to support 50 Forward, and that goes without saying, but I'm looking at the funding source. Is it appropriate for me to ask under conversation for this amendment if what the negative impact would be to historic preservation and what the use of those funds might be so I can make a decision about how to move forward because either way I want to support 50 Ford I just want the least impact and I can't I'm not comfortable taking it from Andrew Jackson home I'm um, sorry um, this specific so who can answer that and is now a good time to ask that um. Sponsor. I don't see anybody from Metro Historic. Right. I will, let's turn to the sponsor. Thank you. Council Lee. Thank you. Um, as the sponsor, I think I, I love hearing that everyone wants to help 50 Forward, and that is my ultimate goal. And um, I uh, would also, um, as the sponsor of this amendment, like to hear about the historic preservation's um, uh, lack, if we took the money from them, what that would do. And if, I don't know if there's anyone here to speak to that or not. And to sharpen the question, the historic preservation, that's the $150,000 source that um, on the amendment from Council Member Davis. Okay. And, uh, Maybe director. the administration knows. Do you, can, can you address can that? Answer, That'd be helpful. That Thank question. you very much. Uh, there is uh, the historic preservation uh, line item that you see in there is to initiate a pilot project to provide uh, historic preservation grants throughout the county to, for specific projects. This has not been done before, uh, so you, it would not be a takeaway of an existing program or service, but um, 
uh, there was an analysis done and Mr. Walker brought forward actually a proposal where uh, other cities um, across the state have implemented similar programs but on a larger scale and we recommended in this budget to begin a small pilot for um, historic preservation grants uh, this cycle. I Thank you very much for that information. It's extremely helpful to me as the sponsor of the current uh, amendment that we're discussing, um, and uh, I appreciate it. Um, I also know that uh, we were able, and just if you could verify with me, we were able to give the Historic Commission the extra employee that they requested. Um, Mr. Cooper, is that correct? Uh, In the that that two people. The two people. So we got. All right, that makes me feel even better. Um, uh, with or it might be technically a person and a half to, to two people. Just want to be very specific. Fantastic. Um, and and um, I, I'd like to um, to hold uh, my next comment, if I can yield the floor to Janet Jernigan, who is here from 50 Forward, um, to speak directly in regard to how the funds will be used. Um, and then uh, we'll go back to where those funds might come from if we're able to move forward, if that would be okay. Thank you, Ms. Jernigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak. Um, 50 Forward has five centers in Davidson County. We are the only county in my uh, research that I've done around the country in Tennessee where we do not get local support from local government. This particular amendment, whether it's uh, the one for 150 or 135, would provide for the number of people that we serve in Davidson County either $9 a person on an annual basis or $10 a person on an annual basis um, for our Turner Center in Bellevue and for our Bordeaux Center. Uh, those centers um, we are looking at in the next fiscal year needing to replace a total of $90,000 from uh, one foundation grant for our Bordeaux Center of 50 that is not going to be available, uh, is not available currently in this calendar year, and then also a change in revenue in our Turner Center of $40,000. Um, in doing that, we would be able to expand services if the, uh, either one of these uh, amendments passes at our Madison location, at our Donaldson location, and our Knoll Center, and those would be primarily an increased transportation to our services and centers for people who no longer drive and are not able to come unless they have transportation, and some expansion of hours to evening and weekend programming. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you for coming this afternoon so that we could uh, um, hear directly from you uh, concerning this. Uh, I, I would like to uh, go ahead um, in light of the information regarding uh, the uh, funding sources that are available on this particular issue, uh, go ahead and uh, move to withdraw uh, my uh, amendment and uh, announce uh, my co-sponsorship of uh, Mr. Davis's amendment uh, to be heard uh, hopefully next in the matter of continuity. Um, okay, thank you, Council Lady. Your motion to withdraw. Um, we're, we're gonna go through these in the order that they're filed, actually, these nine amendments. So um, it doesn't need to be a second to be withdrawn. Uh, well, with that, um, I, you know, I always get a little afraid of withdrawing something that I'm so passionate about, right? <laughs> um, and I would like to go on record, I'd like to speak with uh, Roden and Hager about um, uh, helping uh, seniors out uh, through the Hermitage uh, in some way. And so we can talk about that soon, I hope. And with that, I move to withdraw. Okay, you move to withdraw. I, I don't want anybody in the queue uh, not to have the opportunity to speak. Um, Councilman Roden. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate what Councilmember Van Reese just did. I just wanted, so so everyone on this floor is aware, I have uh, 50 Ford sits at one end right across Donaldson Pike in Mr. Syracuse's district. Many, many of my constituents use that 50 Ford. At the other end of my district, I have part of the Hermitage property, and right across Old Gear Boulevard is where Hermitage sits. It's in Larry's district, but I have many friends and many constituents that go to the Hermitage and, and support that. We have so many visitors, so many tourists, as Larry said, out there, both of Lebanon Road and Old Hickory Boulevard heading to the Hermitage, 
go many, several miles through my district and all the stores, all the shops, all the tourists that go through there stop and eat. So I would hate for us to take any money that might be going toward marketing or tourism or, or just for people knowing that it's out there when they come to Nashville to go visit, I would hate for us to be taking some of that away. With that said, and I think Nancy is well aware of this, um, of the 100 points, and I think you know this, Mr. Chairman, of the 100 points that I put down on my list, 50 of them went to 50 forward. And so I would really, really like to find a funding source for this. I just don't want to take one from one part of my district and you know send it to someone else. So I really want to get a funding source for this without having to you know, pit each other, you know, pit two different parts of my district against each other. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Wiener, if you would see. Council Lady Wiener. Um, Thank you. I'm sorry. I was back here having another meeting. <laughs> sorry about to, that. Um, so my question would be, um, if I have found an alternative funding source and we're going to withdraw this one, I can then be recognized to speak on Scott's and then I can suggest the alternative funding. Uh, yes, it, it, it would be amendable. Um, Perfect. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, Council Lady Van Rees, back to you. Motion move to withdraw. That's right with you. All right. Amendment number five is withdrawn. And we're on to uh, Amendment six of 722, uh, Councilman Scott Davis. Uh, MENS 722 is substituted by one, decreasing the appropriation to plant the g seed garden program in the amount of $50,000, going from $50,000 to zero. Two, by decreasing the appropriation uh, to the police department in the amount of $80,000, reducing the departmental total from $192.7 million to $192.6 million. Three, by increasing the appropriation to the assessor of property in the amount of $130,000 and decreasing, increasing the departmental total from $7.7 .7 million to $7.9 million. Is there a motion? Moved and seconded. And Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, Mr. Jamison, I, I, I know I don't want to step on Council Lady Wainers, but so how do we, how do, if we have additional sources we want to talk about funding to help work, how do we do that specifically with this without asking for a suspension of rules? I, I think she was talking about a second one. You would have to suspend the rules. Okay. Um, but assuming that goes through without objection, then you would move to amend the amendment. Okay. That, that, I just wanted clarification because I was, all right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Davis. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, initially, we wanted the funds to come from um, the forensic lab, which was getting an increase, a larger increase. We're going to take a little bit, but I was informed that we're contractually obligated to pay that. And so um, I was not trying to suspend the rules to um, add in additional funding, um, but but because of the contractual obligation and the confusion, and they put it with the Metro Police Department, which was not the intent to take it from the Metro Police Department, um, I would like to strike the 80,000 or from the um, crime lab or the forensic lab, you know, which, which, which is really from the medical examiner, which were contractually obligated to give them that million dollar increase, you know, for 2018. And and then just to complete your thought, and then to reduce the 130000 by um, that $80,000 number. Yeah, so that my police officers are happy and the, we're in contractual compliance. But um, we need to add the staffing. Right. Am I able to do that without a... If you have to move to suspend the rules. I like to, I like to move to suspend the rules. Um, all, uh, any, any objection? Any objection? No objection? All right. The rules have been moved to be suspended for you to amend your amendment. Yeah. And um, um, can I ask um, our wonderful finance director, Talia, to explain that we are contractually obligated? Yeah. Are we the, the line item that he and I uh, talked about is not in the um, police department. You'll see bullet two. I think... Uh, your intent with your original amendment is there was an administrative line item for the forensic um, 
medical examiner, and I explained to him that that is that is a contracted amount to for them to provide medical examining services for the county, and the amount that is in the budget is based on the contractual requirements. So you can't really use that as a source. We're gonna have to pay that amount anyway. And I've got legal over here nodding their head. So uh, that cannot be used as a secondary source in place of the police department item that you have here. Okay. So I'd like to amend it and to give them the 50 so they can get another. Um, so suspending the rules, you have an amendment to your amendment to, re to take out section two altogether and then to have in section three the amount to go from 130,000 to 50,000. That is correct. That, that is your amendment, okay? It'll be required tomorrow night. He'll be doing that. He's gotta submit it every amendment to this committee, so you might as well suspend here as well as on the floor. Okay. Um, so the amendment as amended, um, omitting two and uh, applying one and three on the floor with the suspension of the rules, and then if, if you're fine for discussion. Yes, sir. Then uh, Councilman Leonardo. One, there you are. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think we already have one additional full-time employee that We've approved. There was one additional full full time employee approved for the assessor's office. And I believe when uh, Assessor Woolhoy came in here um, and and came before the council, she had made some comment about uh, that her appraisers were appraising too much property, and it was somehow a violation of some sort of state law or something. I don't know if I'm stating that right. And if she's here, maybe she could address that, Mr. Chair. Um. Is anyone from the assessor's office here? I I she it. is here? Yeah. Oh, great. Here's our assessor. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you, council members. Uh, thank you, Councilman Leonardo, to give me the opportunity to speak on that. Um, yes, in prior uh, budget hearings as well, I've mentioned about the Tennessee Code annotated 67-1-506A uh, sub 1 that provides that we comply with one deputy assessor per 45 parcels in order to assure, and it reads, in order to assure that each county assessor of property shall have a minimum staff to assist the county assessor in carrying out the duties and responsibility required by law, the assessor is authorized to appoint at least one deputy assessor for each 4,500 parcels of property as determined by the Division of Property Assessment, whom we're governed by, over and above the first 4,500 parcels of property within the assessor's taxing jurisdiction. And so at this present time, we have 247,777 parcels. When one divides that by 45,000 parcels, then that gives us the number of uh, deputy assessors that we must have. So right now, we should have 56 when we have 54. The administration, and I'm very uh, pleased and, and very honored that we've been uh, 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 um, accommodated with two additional assessors, uh, deputy assessors. But the point of the matter is that as we are dividing, as you have all eloquently talked about today, about the growth that's happening in Nashville, subdividing a property that have continued. By the time we get to 2021, which is the next reappraisal, we're gonna be right at approximately 260,000 parcels, meaning that we're gonna need 58 deputy assessors. What is required in order for us to be able to have those deputy assessors in place in order to do the work, we must train them. It's kind of like a police officer, as you were speaking earlier, when they are trained, they go to classes. When they go to classes, they can't ride in a car by themselves. They must be with someone who's already qualified to be able to accommodate them. That's the same thing that happens in reference to appraising property. We must meet the responsibility to identify, list, classify those properties that are located within the jurisdiction of Davidson County, and they must be trained. This is not something for part-time workers, we want to give those property, uh, those new employees the opportunity to be on board, to be trained properly, attend the classes, hopefully to have their credentials by the time we get to 2021, and we desperately need to be able to do that. So that is how it basically works. If there's any other questions, I'd be more than glad to explain further. Thank you, Ms. Woolhoyd. I appreciate it. And uh, I would encourage everyone to support this amendment. I think their office is doing a fine job, as we've seen here recently, and I would ask for your support on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Council Lady Gilmore, let's see if I can get this. There we are. You're good? Okay. Council Lady Allen. There we are. 
Uh, nope. Give me. <laughs> there we Thank go. you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to make sure I understood this. It's, it looks to me like by taking out the forensic lab, which was an $80,000 part of that, we now have only 50000 which won't fund a full position. So are we funding a, a part-time position, or how will, how will this partial payment work with regard to adding a full-time employee? Is this a question for our assessor or for the sponsor? Uh, I, I guess both can answer that. Okay. If you didn't mind, Assessor, um, I don't know if you heard Council Lady Allen's question, which was taking out item two, at least $50,000, um, given that in the substitute there's an increase of um, one position of approximately $65,000 is just actually, I'll let paraphrasing for you, is a $50,000 increase, is that, it, does that fund a full position? Well, the two additional um, full-time employees that has been requested is in the position of an appraiser two, as well as an appraiser three. For an appraiser two, with the fringe benefits, it comes to the amount of $59,000. And for the appraisal three, with their fringe benefits, it's come to the amount of $68,400. Um. And that was the additional educational component to go along with that. Thank you. Um, there may be other questions. Council Lady, did that, yes. any further questions? Um, Council Lady Henderson. Thank you, Chair Cooper. Um, I'm reflecting on um, the, the budget hearing uh, time for the assessor of property. Um, I'm looking in our budget book to see that uh, there are two FTE um, appraisers uh, added to the budget already. And I, Recall from our discussion and our notes, um, Ms. Ledmax O'Neill, the issue of being kind of out of compliance. Um, I thought we addressed that in budget hearings to identify that that was not indeed correct. Uh, from that, your that is that that is correct. Uh, when I consulted Metro Legal, they uh, indicated to me that that was not a requirement, but rather a permissive statute. Did I get that right, John? He's nodding that I got that right. <laughs> okay, I appreciate you clarifying that. So Chair Cooper, just to reiterate for colleagues, the assessor of property does have two additional appraiser positions as budgeted currently. And, and an additional third from the substitute. And additional third in the substitute. They are not per Metro Legal out of compliance and we are discussing a need for the 2021 countywide reappraisal, recognizing that work is done in advance of that, but as we've just gone through that, I guess I would um, say to colleagues that I don't feel that this is a need, frankly. Um, and then also, can we speak to the plant the seed garden program? Does anybody know anything about the program that we're taking $50,000 from? Is somebody here from that program? Uh, we, uh, I can Mr. It. Clay? Mr. Chairman, Hank Clay from Metro National Public Schools. Council Clay, thank you for asking that question. Uh, I was not aware that they came through the Metro's budget, but I want to speak to the great work that they do with our preschool students. Um, they're in uh, early learning centers, Ross, Casas Fran, um, and Bordeaux, and they do excellent works trying to get our kids out of the classroom into gardens where they really feel the, the soul in their hands and see the plants grow. They learn a lot about biology early on, and these being some of our most vulnerable students, um, they get experiences to eat some food that is healthy and that they grow with their own hands. So uh, they do great work. Mm -hmm. uh, I was pleased to see they're in their mayor's budget, and uh, I know all of these programs are worthwhile. And Mr. Clay, is is this a separate 501c3 with whom MNPS partners, or how does that work? Yes. Council Lady, yes, you're correct. It's a separate 501c3, and uh, they have the expertise, train the, their workers and their volunteers to come into our programs. And um, you've worked with them already through one school year or multiple years, uh, or can you speak to that? Council Lady, I don't know the exact date, but it's been at least two academic years and probably longer than that. Thank you. Thank you, Council uh, Councilman Elrod. If I can get this machine to work. One second. All 
All right, there you are. It should work now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not on the budget committee. But I was just going to go to re reiterate that uh, in this budget, we don't, the statute that was referenced, 671506, doesn't require a county to hire any staff. It just says that they shall have a minimum staff, and, but then the property assessor is authorized to appoint some deputy uh, assessors. Um, I'm sure that's, I'm not sure, I may do some research on why the statute is there, but the statute doesn't require us to hire anyone. So I just want to be make that clear because I looked it up. So thank you. Um, thank you. Councilman Pulley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Henderson got to most of my questions, but I did want to call uh, Mr. Clay up for a follow-up to the questions uh, Council Member Henderson asked him. Um, and you did a great job explaining this program, but I would ask you how the uh, funding reduction uh, in the amendment would impact this program. Hank Clay from Metro Nashville Public Schools again. Uh, Councilman, that's a good question um, that I don't know the answer to. I'll, I'd be happy to follow it with planting the seed, but I know you're trying to make decisions right now. Um, I would imagine, considering how lean their budgets are, it would impact the number of schools, the number of students that they're able to serve um, with because they have very limited personnel anyway. That would be my guess. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Council Lady Wiener. Get this Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. In regard to this, you know, young children really benefit from hands-on learning. And I can't wrap my head around the notion of taking away from that program to support a department that has already been allocated the two FTEs and also isn't out of compliance. I'm just, I'm having a real struggle with that. So at this point, I can't support it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Glover. Back. There we are. All right. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, all right. You, there's, this is more housekeeping at my desk. You said there's a total of nine amendments? Uh, there are a, a total of nine amendments. Some are late filed, or at my last count, of which we are on number six. Right, and, and I see one more in my package, so I, whatever number eight and number nine is. Your desk. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'm, I started uh, trying to look through. So is number is number eight and nine where the 50 forward is being dealt with? Because it's not being dealt with in this one, correct? Number seven, just is seven is 50 forward. Uh, number eight is another amendment by Councilman Davis, and uh, number nine is an, an amendment on um, the legal aid uh, approach. Okay, all right. I just wanted to make sure that I, I, I will continue I'll looking. Thank you. Keeping track, Council yeah, Lady thank Henderson you. wanted us to be very clear yeah, no, th thank you. where we were. Thank you. Um, but we are back We are back to six, which is um, amended, to be amended. We'll come back to you, Councilman. Uh, there's still more people wanting to speak. Um, Council Lady uh, Murphy, microphone, here we are. There we are. There it works. I just wanted to say a few words about the program Plant the Seed and, and kind of back it up. I think that um, while I don't have firsthand experience with it, I think it's a great program. I recently voted for it in one of the national vote for us and we get money kind of things online. Um, I've been really impressed that they work with multiple schools, I think six schools, um, ages four to 14, just looking at their website. And it seems to be a great program to not only get our kids out and growing and learning that they can have small gardens, but they're also trying vegetables and fruit that they might not get access to because of how many, how much of Nashville has food deserts. And I think that we can all um, agree that, you know, kids can be picky eaters. I know that I am still a picky eater and, and hopefully this is, is helping kids get that nutrition that they need. And so I really hope that we do not, we don't target this simply because they don't have um, a huge advocate system here tonight or or lobbying us um, because they seem to be pretty homegrown and and a great a great program so I'd ask y'all to to keep its funding thank, thank you you council lady council lady Dowell thank you I want to concur the thoughts that uh, other council members have expressed about the plant the seed program I'm one of the people involved in the master gardening program so I'm very familiar with plant the seed in fact they started a program over at the Cambridge Early Learning Center, which is located in District 32. And I encourage all of you to learn about the program because not only does it teach environmental education, it teaches nutrition, and it teaches a lot of our most vulnerable youth 
who um, lack this type of education to be responsible citizens to the environment and have knowledge about where food comes from and to maintain a healthy lifestyle. And so I think uh, cutting this program would have a, a, a horrible impact, not just on the communities in which these gardens are located and the organizations serve, but just on the entire city and our young people. And I think, moreover, we need to invest in our young people in educating them. I do uh, understand the need for additional resources. Everybody has a need for additional resources. But I do not think cutting a program that has no other duplicated resources to zero uh, to fund an extra staff member for a function that's going to occur in 2021 is the right thing to do. There are other areas we can cut. And uh, so I will not support uh, cutting the plant the seed program, and I encourage you not to cut it as well. Uh, if we're looking for a funding for um, the assessor's office, I encourage you to look somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Lady. Councilman Withers. Thank you so much, for, uh, Mr. Chair, for recognizing me. I know that I'm not on the committee. Um, I, I did receive uh, calls and emails from constituents over the weekend that educated me a little bit further about plant to seed as well. I happen to have some uh, constituents who work very heavily in that uh, project to help educate children about uh, growing fruits and vegetables. And of course, uh, getting young people to eat their vegetables is not always easy, but establishing healthy eating um, habits early is beneficial lifelong. And also I would point out that, you know, uh, nutrition, particularly for uh, some of our impoverished youth, is, is a problem that does lead to reduced educational outcomes and lifelong outcomes. And so I just want our council colleagues to really, really think about who this benefits, which is some of our youngest uh, constituents uh, and helps them to develop lifelong uh, healthy eating habits. And, and please, uh, Please support this program. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Council Lady Haywood. There we are. I just want to echo the sentiments of the last two speakers, and I strongly, strongly stand in support to the Plant to Seed program. I just stand in support of it. Thank you, Council Lady. And then back to Council Lady uh, Allen. Um, did you want to have um, Council Lady Allen? Do you have a comment? Sorry, here we are. Back. There you are. Thank you. I, I should have done this the first time. I, I concur with everyone else, and data shows that if kids grow their own food, they're more likely to eat it. So the best way to get a kid to eat broccoli is to have them pull it out of the dirt themselves. Uh, I do want to thank uh, the, the, the property assessor. She is the hardest working person I've ever met. She is at every single meeting, um, and I, I applaud her planning ahead. I, I do feel like we've got time to give her that extra person to get them um, trained and on board by 2021, by planning ahead for next year's budget and not surprising this program by, by pulling this money out from them at the last minute. So, I mean, I think we, we all would be supportive of continuing to help her build her program in time for the, for the assessment. But I concur with my fellow council members that we need to hang on to this plant, the seed money. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Lady. And back to our sponsor, Councilman Davis, uh, on his amendment, which has been amended. Okay. We all, I know that we all see the importance of helping the assessor. Now, I've got a quick question before I continue. Can we come back and give them an appropriation after the budget? Or we're not allowed to do that because we can't do a 4% for them? Um, on what they want. I mean, I'm asking if they come back. Well, well, I defer to counsel and legal counsel. It depends on what, on what they're asking for the appropriation for. They're needing... Um, and if I'm just make sure I'm clear, in in Councilman Cooper when he submitted his substitute budget, did you include an extra person? Yes. Okay, so they do have one extra person, so they only they only needed another one. Yes. Okay. Well, so the mayor's the mayor gave them two, and then you gave them another one. Well, we we are we are already need, providing another one. Okay, we're already providing another one, so they'll need one more, and we could come back after the budget to appropriate them more help if need be. Correct. Mr. Co Mr. Sorry, Mr. Jameson. A supplemental appropriation is possible. Yes. Okay. Even if it's for another staff member. It's if even it's for any operational purpose. Okay. Um, knowing that, I like to withdraw, but I'd also like to remind. I'm glad everybody is so concerned about the youth in our community, and I will continue that discussion on the bill coming up. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, well, motion to withdraw um, as made by the sponsor. So um, Amendment 6 is withdrawn. Now we're on to Amendment 7, also by Councilman Davis, uh, moving to amend 722. One, by decreasing the appropriation from historic preservation in the amount of $150,000 to zero, and two, by increasing the appropriation to 50 forward uh, by the same $150,000. Is there a motion? Yes. Motion made and seconded. Um, Councilman Davis is the sponsor, and you're the first in the queue. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to echo what so many other council members. I want to thank Council Lady Van Rees for her leadership. And more importantly, I want to move this forward. Uh, we all love those who are, even though I don't consider 50 older or even 60 older, but I know there's a lot of folks in our community that are 70 and up, and these services that 54 provides are valuable to all our communities. So please, please support this amendment because we love our people and we love our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, <coughs> Councilor Wiener. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Um, I have a question for Director Lomax. In terms of the historic preservation, could we move forward with at least getting this thing underway and planning with half the funds or roughly 60 some odd thousand dollars of the funds, no. give or take. Uh, part of it has already, it's already been reduced somewhat in the uh, substitute budget that is uh, before you by 100,000. So that leaves 150,000 for the pilot. Quite frankly, I just don't know how, how much 150 will get you. You know, I don't know if that's 10 projects or 100 projects. I simply don't know the scope of that, so. Okay. So I guess my notion is back to what we've discussed before. Thank you, Talia. What we had discussed before was it's easier to take something that hasn't been given yet for something that clearly has a demonstrated need. Um, and so I was thinking in terms of taking 66.5 from historic preservation instead of all of it, and then taking 68.5 from the assessor's office to equal roughly $135,000, what would be $135,000 instead of one hundred and fifty. dollars um, And so what I'm suggesting is we maybe consider, instead of one fifty, dollars allocating one thirty-five, dollars and splitting where the money comes from for those two sources. In terms of the assessor's office, I think we've already made ourselves pretty clear about where that stands. And it, I just, I hate to see us take all of it away from historic preservation would like to leave something so we can start to move it forward in some sense, but not knowing a lot about that particular program, I'm almost at a loss. So that's where I am. Um, okay, I'm, I'm trying to process all of this. I will say I've spent some time with uh, Director Walker. I, I do think that um, the program was initially in the mayor's proposal at $250,000. This 150 is a is a lower number, and um, Knoxville, for example, has five hundred thousand dollars is the equivalent number. So um, I, I think this—I know this would be treated very seriously by historic. I don't think that there's anybody here from there today. But um, was this in the form of a of a motion, Council Lady, <laughs> or do you want to hear the discussion? I'd like to hear the discussion because okay. I'm also thinking about. I don't want to take anything from Historic's operating budget because we know where that need is, okay. um, and, I, and I really don't want to touch that, but I'd like to hear some okay. other conversation insofar as the Historic preservation okay. piece. Off to the discussion on Amendment 7. Uh, Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. Well, you've already answered the one question I was going to ask if there was anybody here from Historic. Um, that being said, so. Uh, Director Lomax, so let me, so there was original 250, 100 of it's been taken. This would literally, this would take it down to zero, correct? If, uh, if, yes, that's what I see in the, in the proposal, to take it to zero. Right. Okay. But it's, it's also a program, I want to kind of make sure I'm following along uh, what Council uh, Lady Weiner said was, th this has been, not been being done in the past. 
Correct. It was going. This it was proposed to be a pilot program for the upcoming budget. And what does it what does it attempt to accomplish? I, I know we had a lot of conversations, and I know they. And then maybe you remember, maybe you don't remember. But if you don't, then maybe Chairman Cooper could help kind of refresh our memory a little bit. Both both myself and John Cooper um, uh, have been have had discussions with him about it, so he may be able to fill in some holes that um, that I don't remember. But the intent was to provide small grants to, um, I don't know if it's individual homeowners, to provide um, for um, specific preservation projects. Uh, I, I haven't talked with Mr. Walker directly. I've talked with Audra Ladd in the mayor's office who was kind of working with him on putting the program together. Um, it could be done several ways. Um, I don't think it could be a direct grant to a homeowner. Um, there are some legal issues there. Uh, it, they could be grants to nonprofits um, that, that do this type of work, or they could be used as matching funds for other grants that, um, that you know, um, nonprofits or other institutions can apply for. Um, so the, the intent is to just provide capital funds for um, fixing up historic properties across the county. Okay. And so, Chairman Cooper, uh, I'm going to ask you, because you, you've had conversations with them as well, um, what's the uh, what's the unintended consequence of this if, if we go ahead and follow down this path and don't recognize what maybe another council member is suggesting from a funding source? Well, just having had the benefit of being in a, in a lot of hearings, um, I think historic preservation would say that these are seed grants that are leverageable with other grants that okay. you have to get, that they're state and federal grants that become available once you get the process going. And other cities have used this kind of program to leverage more preservation money um, uh, in, into the program. And again, I think the mayor recognized that when she uh, created a slightly larger pilot program than the one that's here being, being cut. But I'd, I, I think that's a fair summary of this. It, it, is a, it is a pilot. It would be administered by the historic staff as a tool in specific preservation grants. Um, but again, I defer other, Chairman Allen may have a great insight into that too, being from, again, the Planning and Historic Commission. Then, yeah, then, then I would prefer to yield, because I, I, I'm like Council Lady Weiner. I'd like to hear the full conversation before we, we act upon this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Let me, there are a lot of people in the queue, so the machine is slightly jammed up. So, there you are, Council Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I certainly can't say I'm an expert on it. My understanding was that it was also uh, with the intention of sort of being able to rescue things that were at risk of being demolished, and everyone recognizes the need and no one can do anything about it because funds aren't available. And this was a, an attempt to try to create some funds that would be available um, to grab things while before we lost them. So and to me, it, it, it um, I mean, I understand the need maybe to reduce it from 250 to 100, which is how we actually funded the extra person that they so desperately needed. Um, so I would- to, to 150. Excuse me, to 150, by 100, down to 150. Um, so I would, I would hate to see it totally wiped out um, in the first year of trying to, to put this thing into place. I think it's a, another important piece of, of trying to preserve historic. I mean, you know, we talk about how important tourism is, and I think our historic heritage is a, is a huge contributor to that. So I would hope that we would try to preserve a piece of it if we can. Thank you, Council. And also, I had one, one other question. Um, I'm looking at 50 forward for the 2017 budget, and they got $59,900 in the, um, my, my terminology, in the CEF program in the past, but now they are one of the agencies that will be applying for funds from the Community Partnership Fund, I'm thinking. So it's possible they're getting money from Metro anyway once that process happens. Can someone speak to how that Community Partnership <laughs> Fund allocations are happening? Uh, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, I, I don't know, if, did they receive funding in the current year? Because then I can then I can answer your question very clearly. The um, proposal for the community partnership fund is that any agency that uh, received funding in the current year budget would be offered an opportunity to receive up to sixty percent 
of the allocation of that budget into the FY18 budget. And, but there was a, um, a provision in there that if a department received a direct appropriation, that they would not be eligible to receive community partnership fund dollars. So uh, in terms of, um, in terms of this specific request, you did receive funding in FY17? Um, yes, $59,000, so if we were to apply in the transition, it would be 30000 the maximum. Uh, I want to point out that 50 Forward is the equivalent of 12 to 15 nonprofit organizations and other communities, and again, in other communities, the senior centers are either fully or partially funded by local government. The community enhancement grant priorities have not been for senior centers. We have never received um, any community enhancement grant funds or other local government operating funds for our senior centers. Um, in another community, those supportive care programs that have been funded by community enhancement grant would actually be provided by a separate uh, 501c through three corporation and actually in most cities the five centers here are separate 501c3 organizations it just happens that for efficiency and a lot of other reasons we have all of that as part of, of one nonprofit organization and so, also the priorities for the funding for community enhancement grant as that transitions to another one uh, older adults, the supportive care services that we have had funded in the past are no longer in those priorities. So we're pretty well going to be locked out of any uh, local government funding at all for any of our services um, after next year. So in, in follow up to that, um, they would, if they were to receive a uh, direct appropriation in this budget, they would have to forego any funding from the community partnership fund in FY18. Okay, okay, thank, thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Chairman, are you any further, uh, Chairman Allen, any further questions? Okay, all right, uh, on to the queue. Councilman Withers. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I actually did have an opportunity to speak with uh, Director Walker over the weekend. He's one of my constituents and was talking to him about some other matters and uh, was able to speak on, on this topic. As uh, you and I think maybe some others have pointed out, the original request was for quite a bit uh, more than this. I think the mayor's uh, budget proposal reduced that request fairly significantly and that this one reduces it further. Uh, in my conversations with uh, Director Walker and, and perhaps he can address the council directly, I'll try to reach out to him to let him know to do that. But part of the concern is that, you know, historic preservation efforts are in fact so expensive that uh, reducing the program uh, beyond uh, a certain amount sort of makes it not uh, a worthwhile endeavor at this point at all, potentially. And I'll just share, you know, my own thought. I'm a member of Woodland Presbyterian Church, which has a national register a listed uh, building. And uh, for our church, we are just replacing a roof, which water damage can cause a lot of trouble. Replacing a roof, getting some reglazing done on our stained glass windows, replacing an HVAC and carpet. And uh, just for those small things with, with preserving our building, um, the cost went from 110 to 180 while we were waiting on bids. So if you can imagine, if you were to try to do even some, what, some small things to a historically significant structure, that's a, a very, very large dollar amount that would be needed to do that. So I, I will leave it up to the, 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 the committee to make a rec recommendation today since I'm not on there, but I will try to reach out to Director Walker. But that was the concern that he raised to me, is that if we were to reduce the funding for that pilot program too much, that it would not actually be helpful to the potential recipients. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Mina Johnson. There we are. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. I really appreciate entertaining the non-committee member's uh, question. Um, the question was touched by Community enhance Enhancement Fund and Community Partnership Fund. So here's a question to the administration and finance. So if I understand correctly, uh, Community Enhancement Fund will be no longer uh, managed by finance department going uh, FY18. So all the nonprofit who have been uh, allocated the funding from the financial department in the 
current year will have a different mechanism to be funded, not via finance department, but uh, directly from other department. Is that correct? Yes, what's re recommended in the budget is a million dollars for a transition year uh, as we design what the new program may look like and what I described before in terms of how that funding is going to be allocated. Uh, Mr. Lionel Matthews is going to be coordinating that for the administration in terms of getting the funding to the nonprofits next year. So in that process, I understand a 54 has been receiving uh, 59,000 uh, plus. So in that transition, they are not eligible to receive a community partnership fund for FY18? The, the guidelines that have been established is that there would be quote unquote no double dipping because there are fewer funds available. So if, a, if an organization were uh, identified to receive a direct appropriation through the budget process, then they could not also receive something through the community partnership fund, and that's a way to, you know, to be able to spread that money further. So in other words, uh, if uh, 54 does not receive direct funding uh, in this process, so they would, if still, they would still be eligible to get the portion for the community partnership fund. So would that be uh, limited to 60%, 30,000? Or would it be possible to get uh, it would 100? Be, it would be 60% of whatever their allocation is for FY17. And I don't have that number right in front of me. I think she indicated it'd be about 58,000. So in order for us to fund, we have to fund uh, just the direct funding or their choice would be receive only $30,000 via community uh, partnership funding. Uh, yes, you've got the process correct. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Councilman Swope, give me a moment. Too many people in the machine. There we are. He won't, oh. he won't like it that oh, you call you me. Are. So you've changed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you, Chair. I, I just want to make a comment that uh, historic preservation is hard to do in Tennessee because we don't have a state income tax. So there is not a way to do sell tax credits to develop properties like you very well know. And so uh, anybody that is interested in preservation, it's uh, compared to other states, uh, we, we struggle with that. And um, at this moment where the city is growing so dramatically, all the properties that uh, were preserved just because of uh, the fact that the city wasn't developing are, are going to be gone within a couple of years. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention that preservation is at a, in a tough place right now and that uh, we cannot count like other states in being able to sell tax credits to develop property. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Pridemore, there we go. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, this is for a program that hasn't been initiated yet, but my my purpose for uh, has to be uh, recognized is, along with uh, you, you, is serving on the Community Partnership Fund, and I in the past, and Director uh, O'Neill, that procedure is not a guarantee. Just because you receive the funds one year, you have to, unless the, the or the selection process may have changed, it has changed just for this year. But in, but in transition, but in the past, uh, they had to go through a selection process. So they're not guaranteed just because your name is, was, uh, is on the list or in fact you've had uh, been awarded funds in the past uh, you got to go through a pretty strenuous uh, selection process each year. So uh, just because they're on this fund doesn't mean they're going to receive the funds. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Glover. One, it's not. There we are. Thank you, Chair. All right. So, Director O'Neill, let me. Let us, I want to go back through the numbers here. I want to make sure I understand them correctly. Uh, I think there's some confusion on the floor from several of us. So if they received approximately $58,000 in this past uh, 58, 59, let's just call it 60. All right, let's just call it 60 in a round number. Mm -hmm. 
So if it's 60,000, they could uh, potentially get a grant or however you're awarding these for up to 60% of whatever we got in the, or whatever they got in the past, right? Yes, that is what's So that would proposed. be roughly $36,000. But if we give them anything, if we give them 40,000, uh, any, then it disqualifies them from receiving any, uh, uh, not even, they don't even have the opportunity to apply for that. Exactly, but there's really not an application process because it's the awardees from the current year okay. that are being considered for that because it's a transition year. Okay, okay. okay. So um, for the transition period, there is not a planned application process that Councilman Pridemore uh, discussed before, which was very strenuous. Okay. All right. So, but, but so now, I mean, I think we have the math on the floor correct now. Then, so the maximum they could receive if we don't do anything here uh, this evening would be, I'm going to say, roughly thirty-six thousand yes. dollars. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Councilman Broton. But give me a moment. This is. There we are. Great. <laughs> Just a point of order, Mr. Chairman, where are we procedurally right now on this? I've kind of got lost in where we are. Uh, procedurally, we're on Amendment 7, um, Mr. Davis's amendment, and in ma motion made and seconded and in discussion. And Council Lady Weiner was thinking about uh, offering That's an I amendment. That's why I got confused. I didn't know yeah, if she'd actually. But we wanted to hear our robust discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And then this brings to, to um, actually Council Lady Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to see, do we know how much it is for the average house to be preserved since this is a grant process? Do we have that information? Anybody? Well, I, and I, I believe it's structures. I don't know that it's limited to houses. Okay. So I guess just trying to get an idea what the average structure look like, because at this point we have $150,000 left, right? Currently, yes. Okay. And so and I'm just going off the uh, council member that had cited his church and how it went up to several hundred thousand dollars just for, yeah. Well, well I think part of this is to be, to be matched, that they're state and federal programs. Okay, that uh, it could be matched. That it's not paying for all of it because it couldn't. Okay. And then I, I had a question for Ms. Jernigan, if she could come forward as well. Thank you. Uh, could you tell us how many centers you have? Um, how many 54 centers? We have seven uh, full-time senior centers, five in Davidson County and two in Williamson County. And so if you were to have the $150,000, do you know how it would be allocated? Yes, we would allocate $30,000 each for the five Davidson County centers. So okay, so each center would get it. Morneau, Turner, Madison, Donaldson, and Knoll Center. Okay, and so it would yes. definitely go across the city. Right, absolutely. Okay. So I think, thank you so much for that. I think I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just support um, 50 forward because seniors are important A, and then I like the fact that it would go across the entire city. And I think there's still some questions to be had about this grant process and the 150,000 and the fact that it's been reduced already and we don't know if it would have the desired effect that we intend for it. So um, to me, that sounds fair enough, 30,000 across each District. I mean, that's a win-win, and we know preservation, unfortunately, it's only in some districts. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Council Lady Wiener. So I have to decide whether or not I'm going to move an amendment. Well, if you wish, there are two more council people. I would like to hear them, All right. please. All right, then shifting over, Council Lady Dowell. Thank you. Steve got one of my questions answered about like how much funding they will be eligible for. But what I would like to say is that when we look at the budget overall, there are very few line items that are designated to supporting seniors in our community. And seniors have done a lot for our community. And while these five centers are in specific areas, I want you to know that they serve as people in other areas. And I'll give you an example. I'm out in the Southeast Nashville Antioch area and I have plenty of seniors asking for a center. And it's unfortunate um, this budget year, she was kind of commingled in 54 it was with two other organizations that really were not supported in the community. But many of my neighbors that live in Southeast Nashville travel over to Donaldson because that is the nearest 54 center. And they want to participate in these programs. They feel like we fund everything else in this city, but nothing is really designated for them. 
and uh, they would like to have spaces. Um, we have recreation centers that we have pretty much um, designated kind of after school centers for a lot of our young people. And we've left out this uh, seniors. All of us will be seniors one day, uh, some of us sooner than others. And so I do think that we should uh, fund 50 Forward. And I think we should also take it starting today, because I always tell budget season starts like a year ahead of time. But I do think that we all should start looking at how we can better service the seniors in our community who have done so much and we've done so little um, uh, to service them. And so I ask that you do fund it. I, I am very much um, for historic preservation. So this is a tough one for me. But it appears to me that we <laughs> have not substantially funded them in a way for them to be effective. And so it may be that we could defer uh, funding um, this historic preservation program until the next budgetary year when we can determine how we can fund them at an appropriate level. So I ask that you support Fund 54, and I ask that we all agree going forward that we are going to support this uh, wonderful organization that we'll all probably utilize someday. Thanks. Thank you, Council Lee. And then we come back to the um, last uh, two speakers, the sponsor, and then uh, Council Lee Weiner. So I think after hearing what everyone has shared and for all of the reasons that are extraordinarily clear, I think that it makes sense to leave your amendment intact and not try to split up these other two. I think that will fully fund the things that they're looking to do in those five centers and it will also give us the opportunity to do the right thing by our seniors. So for those reasons, I think I'm not going to amend this to take money out of um, the assessor's office and to reduce the amount from historic. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Council Lady, and then back to the sponsor. Councilman Davis. Hmm. I, like to, I like to move the amendment, please. Okay, uh, motion having been made and seconded, amendment number seven to 722. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? No. Uh, it uh, is approved and recommended to the council. Amendment number eight, also by Councilman Davis, uh, Ordinance 722 uh, has three items. Moving to amend uh, 722, one, by decreasing the appropriation to contribute second harvest in the amount of $100,000, reducing the function total from $200,000 to $100,000. Two, by decreasing the appropriation in the, to the Contribute Adventure Science Center in the amount of 100000 reducing the function total from 200000 to 100000 And three, by increasing the appropriation in Section 1, Schedule B, Juvenile Court, in the amount of $200,000, increasing the department total from $12.4 million to $12.6 million, and of the 12.6 million appropriated to the juvenile court in full motion shall receive a grant of $250,000 from these appropriations. Is there a motion? Um, motion made, is there a second? Second. second. And with that, Councilman Davis, the sponsor. Hang on one, there we are. Thank you, I stand in support and I wanna to look to my council members. The caucus made a promise and we support it. We told we it was very important that we support our seniors with 50 forward and that we support the youth within full motion. Now, we have done our part as a caucus to ensure that 50 forward is on the record and 50 forward amendment is there. I sponsored the amendment at the request of several of you members and the council. Once again, I wanna thank my caucus members for their leadership now it's time to do the same thing for in full motion. And once again, there may be other areas that we could take this money from. You know, I've been told that there, be, there may be some money going to Goodwill that we could talk about, you know, from another program. Now, Second Harvest is already getting increased, but it's an important program, I would give it that. And also, we are going to still be giving Adventure Science Museum $100,000. But we have to show the youth of our communities that we support them. And I admire Councilman Cooper's leadership in providing the, the 50 grand, but 50 grand 
is not enough to let them know that we care about the youth. We're the It City, we have money for other things, and it may hurt a little, but we need the support, you know? And I've been given suggestions, maybe looking at the Sister Cities program. You know, I didn't suggest it, but there may be somewhere else that we could talk about this. And, but this is a very important item to me and my caucus members. And I want to remind people, I usually don't do this, but this is how important this is. The caucus stood with you with supporting 50 Ford and a lot of the things. Stand with us and in supporting in full motion for their full ask. And once again, I want to thank Councilman Cooper for trying to get us 50, 000, getting information 50,000, but it's not enough. And we've, we've given them money before, it's a worthy organization. 50,000 is just not enough. And I kept my word, I didn't take it from other areas. I defended the, even though I didn't feel like it, and for other reasons, but we didn't take anything from Hermitage, didn't attack any other organizations to take the money. What we need to do is we need to show the youth of this, of our community that we care about. And one more important thing, you know, $8 million, and I'm a graduate of Hillwood, okay? So I'm putting my business on Front Street. Hill, for the new school in West Nashville, people lined up and spoke in support, which was great. But the night was getting long. When in full motion folks lined up, we respectfully asked them, hey, we get it. We support you, can you please cut it a little short? They did it while other people didn't, and they didn't want to. And that's one thing. They showed the council the courtesy and the respect, and they believed us when we said that we hurt them. Now we have to show them now in our budget. So that's why, we're fight that's why I'm fighting hard for this. And that's why I'm asking the Donaldson Hermitage folks, the Madison folks, you know, and my caucus members to please come to the rescue and please surround, circle the wagons, and help this program. 50,000 is an insult I feel to this program, you know? And so I know there's other areas that if you don't agree where we're taking the money, there's other areas, like we mentioned the 150,000, which, you know, I'm gonna ask, um, you know, our, our, our very talented, you know, finance department, you know, about a program from NASTRA or a construction program through the workforce development that's give, allegedly giving in goodwill $150,000 from that. Maybe that's where we can look at it too, but I encourage the debate and I just wanna thank you all for your cooperation and sorry you're gonna be here for a little while, but this is extremely important to my caucus members. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Councilor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I appreciate Mr. Davis's advocacy for, for vulnerable people, and, and you know, I wish we had enough money to give everybody everything they need, and the info motion folks certainly made a great case for the uh, efficacy of their program. My, my first question was be, clearly the program has functioned um, th this past year very effectively. How, how is it funded this year? And I guess, Director O'Neill, can you answer that one? Uh, we don't. We don't know. They don't receive a uh, an appropriation in the current year budget. Is there a representative here that can tell us how they were funded in the past year? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. Good evening. I'm Cynthia Fitzgerald, Executive Director of In Full Motion, and I'm available and open for your questions. I like to first tell you that In Full Motion is has been funded. 98% um, from corporate foundations, corporate partnerships, in-kind contributions from all universities in the Davidson County area, uh, with the exception of we not formed a partnership with David Lipscomb. We work with Belmont, Tennessee State, uh, American Baptist College with in-kind contributions, and then numerous church organizations uh, that we work with. Uh, and we are a full year out of school day program involved with NASA as an anchor partner, which in the last year we were funded for I think a total of 15 slots. And the anchor partner for NASA would be $1,232 per slot last year. Other than that, it was corporate, business, private, 
public foundations and in-kind contributions from Metro Nashville Public Schools. Definitely we participated at Stratford High School, East High School, Pearl Cone High School, and then 98% um, of our funding has been from the uh, business, corporate, and individual donations. Thank you. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful to know. What, can you tell me what your budget was last year? Our uh, budget was a little over $400,000, and this, expand, this uh, request, this amendment would allow us to expand our um, services to the middle school student who we see feeding into low-performing high schools across all councilmatic districts. So in this uh, additional funding, we'll be able to reach our fifth through eighth graders that would prepare those low performing schools, high school clusters, better to be college ready and of course ACT prep ready. Gotcha, thank, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Um, again, this is a hard one for me. I, I, I feel like the Adventure Science Center also serves our youth very much. I mean, it's, it is where it gets kids excited about STEM, which is the, the secret to job security. Um, and I think it's a great partnership with um, with full motion, so I hate I hate to see funds taken away from that, especially in an eclipse year when they're going to be a huge part of getting everybody in Nashville excited about learning and being intellectually curious. Um, and then, secondly, I, I feel like uh, Second Harvest probably helps our seniors. Um, I'm certainly done Meals on Wheels, and I know that you know providing food for that population is is equally as important as providing a, a safe place for them to spend their days. So I I would. Um, Hope if we decide to give this very large amount uh, above the fifty thousand that Councilmember Cooper's already advocated that we that we try to look for some other places to pull it from because I feel like these are these are um, pulling from the very populations that we that we are trying to be committed to to helping. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Councilman Glover, if I can get this to work. There we are. Thank you, Chair. So. I, I was trying to understand the, the 15 slots, uh, so if I could get clarification there, it looks like that's about $18,480, so roughly 5% of the overall uh, $400,000 budget. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and is anybody here from the Adventure Science Center? Because what I, I just wonder, don't... Doesn't this contribution help to underwrite some of our kids that are that are going to the center and visiting there throughout the school year? Uh, aren't some of these monies used to pay for I'm, I'm a, for, for the uh, t the entry ticket for probably that's the wrong word to use, but in order to get them into the Adventure Science Center? Uh, yes, that is exactly what it's for. It's to uh, provide youth the opportunity to uh, visit. Um, the center during the year and other services. Okay, but and that's the primary focus for Metro Metro schools uh, youth. Right, and so they they utilize. The, how much did they have? I'm I'm sorry, I don't. How much did they have in last year's budget? Yeah, uh, their their appropriation is recommended to be flat at two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand flat. Okay, and then what exactly is the uh, utilization from Second Harvest? Uh, what what. It, what it, what do they use that money for? Is it is it is it directed to a particular population? I mean, obviously we know the population that uses it, but is there any stipulations on what they can use it for, who they have to use it for, the et cetera? Only, the only stipulation is that they be Davidson County uh, residents. Okay. But it's to provide you know food, emergency food uh, for families in need. Okay. And then, uh, Chairman, I'm I'm assuming um, the way this is written. There's 100,000 being recommended from uh, Second Harvest, 100,000 from Adventure Science. I'm assuming that he's removing your line item of the 50,000. Is it, am I? I think it includes the 50,000. I, well, I, that's what I'm guessing at. So, Mr. Jameson, if we were to pass this like this, it's an amendment to uh, the substitute. What housekeeping needs to be done with inside of this amendment? Uh, probably a resolution passed to allow the pass-through from juvenile uh, subsequently, but otherwise nothing immediately. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Council Lady Wiener, if I can. This one, are. too, is a tough one. Um, I see three issues. I see seniors in need of support and food. I see hungry families. 
I see youth education, and I see a program that has an ongoing budget that we've allocated $50,000 to, and I have to look at some other suggestions that were made. Goodwill employs folks with disabilities, so for me, you don't touch that. Um, I really think that that we need to consider that we accept our $50,000 allocation that our chair has offered them and look a little harder next year at what they've done. Let's explore their program. I'm extraordinarily impressed with what In Full Motion does. I think they've done great work. But we also have young children and we have hungry families that we need to look at. If we can find another non-substantial impact, then maybe we could take another look at that. But for me, these are, are not anything that I'm comfortable with right now. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Councilman Leonardo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to thank Ms. Fitzgerald for being here and, and for um, running this program. I uh, you know, I too am a product of education, and, and I definitely wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't have access or opportunity to it, and it didn't always come so easy. But um, in my district just a couple weeks ago, we had um, a 14-year-old got shot in the middle of the day in a residential neighborhood, and I, we had a, a, a candlelight vigil. We were talking to a few pastors and, and you know, the family and all that, and obviously it's a tough thing to go through. Um, for anyone who has to be affected by that. But the one thing that's hit me every time I've looked at this budget um, is the fact that there's not a whole lot in here for kids. I mean, you know, NASA's a great program, and Opportunity Now is great, but again, I don't know that we're targeting and reaching some of the children that we're trying to target in the community. Um, I wish we had a million dollars set aside for youth programs in this budget to where we could have people, you know, submit grants and we could review them and, and when the tracking and all, and we could fund some of these youth programs. But I think this is a wonderful, Opportunity, I think education does uh, level the playing field and sets children apart, and they're doing a great thing. And this is something that uh, would fill the gaps in my district where some of these other programs are just not reaching the community. Uh, so I would I would support this, and namely because what else have we seen in this budget process that helps kids? You know, we have kids killing kids here in Nashville, and this is a serious, serious thing. And you know, crime is up in the summer, and and so the these things could just really it could grow exponentially into districts and into communities. I mean, we had Ron Slay who came in here, who was a you know one of the hot. He's a legendary basketball player who was a product of this uh, program as well. Uh, so I think this is kind of a no-brainer if you live where I live and you see what I see. Um, and so I'm going to be supporting this, and I would ask you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Withers. I can get this turned on. There we are. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, for recognizing me again. Uh, I did uh, enjoy learning more about the In Full Motion uh, programs uh, during a minority caucus uh, meeting that uh, Council Member Scott Davis had organized. I definitely support the program. I do have some concerns about these specific funding sources as, as the means of, of doing that because some of, uh, I think to Council Member Allen's point, some of the same families that uh, utilize these services also benefit from Second Harvest Food Bank, which uh, feeds so many um, vulnerable people in our community. The one thing that really does uh, did impress me about this presentation is the outreach to middle school students. Um, I believe that NPS and even Dr. Joseph would agree that we have a middle school problem. We're doing pretty well with our elementary schools, but the middle schools are an area uh, where we continue to struggle in Nashville. And the more that we can do to specifically beef up our support of middle school students uh, will will help them to break that cycle of poverty. I'm not one who believes that test scores are the be all and end all of students. And I always hate to hear schools be labeled as low performing. And I reject the term that they're failing because uh, test scores are low, but there is a lot of evidence that test scores are a key to college and opportunity. So I think these are, these are important things to fund. I'm not quite certain about these funding sources, but I do want us to keep looking for it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Council Lady Gilmore. Thank you. I had a couple of questions for Ms. Fitzgerald. I wanted to know how many Schools do you work with? I know you name, but do you know how, like, do you have a number? About? Yes, um, our population, uh, Council Lady Gilmore, is made up of students from all over the Council Medic District and Davidson County. So on an annual basis, our budget call for 
no more than 1,000 students who attended over 100 schools in Davidson County. That includes middle school, high school, and in some cases, uh, adult learning centers, as well as, of course, our charter and even a few late elementary school students coming in at the fourth grade. The predominance of our students, of course, is still high school students, and those cover all high school cluster. They come to a location that's closest to them on Saturday mornings, but now this expansion, this, this amendment would allow us to go into the middle schools, as many as uh, available, we had estimated with the $250,000 that we would be able to serve 250 students. And that would be across at least eight to 10 middle schools. Those who are feeding, again, as Councilman uh, Leonardo said, they're named low performing based on test scores, but we're looking at college ready scores and the early intervention is key between the middle school years. And how many students would you know um, that you are able to help get into colleges and uh, get scholarships? Do you have that information? Well, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, we uh, contracted with a vendor at one of our National College Access and Success workshops, and they have indicated the data shows that we're over 90 percent enrollment in college. And that is actually three times the national rate, and of course it also is at least two times the rate in the state of Tennessee. And these are, again, low-income students or students who are zoned to a cluster that is economically disadvantaged by the Tennessee Department of Education or has family resources scarce and come to us with a need to supplement the school day. Mm -hmm. And what would you, what is the, remind me again, what is the average ACT score for uh, Davidson County students? The average uh, ACT score for Davidson County students, according to the Tennessee Department of Education's uh, great report, was 18.7. And it takes 20, does it take a 21 at least to get a scholar, HOPE scholarship? It takes a 21 to get the HOPE scholarship, and generally that uh, ACT score, along with other factors that colleges uh, in, actually consider has continued to rise. So with our middle school students and our high school students, our data shows that we are with just 20 hours in our program, so we're talking about middle school now, actually doing the afternoons after school on site would increase that. Okay, and do you know what the total number of dollars are that your students have received in scholarships? Like oh my gosh. Well, of course we have not done a survey on all dollars, but just one of our partners, the Tennessee Minority Supply Development Council, provides 100 plus thousand dollars a year for in full motion students who achieve at least a 19 on the ACT and have the references and character and uh, the deserving students. And in the last five years, uh, we have exceeded and we look, 600000 from just one of our partners. Wow, so $600,000. Okay, solid. so thank you so much. And you said your budget was 400000 your total budget? Exactly. I'm sorry, 424000 based on our last uh, financial statements, 2016. Okay. Well, 990. Okay, I appreciate you providing that. I looked online for um, the Venture um, Science Center, and in 2009, their operating budget was $4 million. And so I think sometimes I look at the efficacy of certain organizations, and I'm just really impressed that In Full Motion has been able to serve over 1,000 students with 90% uh, college enrollment, you're not, you're not, um, what I like is you're not stationary, that you are actually making partnerships and using facilities that are already within the city. And we talk about combining, building on what you have. And you've partnered, you have partnered with um, high schools and middle schools and having access to facilities. So we know at this point, most of the monies are going to students and not going to facilities. And I know you have a large volunteer base. So, I mean, I just think it's really impressive. And I would just say, I think sometimes we have to give other organizations that are doing the hard work 
and that don't have as large dollars, you know, give, give somebody else the opportunity to do some good work as well, because you're already doing the good work, and you've been doing it for quite a few years here, and I don't know how many years, how many years have we been funding the Adventure Science Museum now? Mm -hmm. How many years have they been in the budget? They have been in the budget since the inception of Metro because it's a, re it's a requirement that we provide a minimum appropriation to them. Okay. Well, I just wanted to ask, so since the inception, that's 50 years. I think it's time to help some other people out. I mean, you know, sometimes because you're not there in the inception and in the beginning, it, it kind of automatically puts you out of the game. And I think, I think that's what I want other people to understand. Sometimes if you're not a part of the system when it originally happens, you just automatically miss it. And I think... You've done the work, you got the, the um, appropriation one year, and then the rules kind of changed. So I think you've, you've, you've shown yourself, um, like I said, over a thousand students. Someone sent me something today about the high schools, and out of the high schools in the state of Tennessee, there's only two that have a 90% preparation rate. And those two high schools are Hume Falk and Martin Luther King. Yes. I mean, so the work you're doing is really a good work. I support it. We talk about um, students having access to college no matter where they are. If you don't have a 21, you're not going to get a scholarship. You're just not. And so we want students to take advantage of that. So I definitely support you. I can't speak for the rest of the colleagues, but I think you've done a wonderful job with what you have, and I look forward to um, helping you to expand so that you can serve more students. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Council Lady Hurt, hang on one second. I'm sorry. It's there we are. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and and I really appreciate the opportunity to to say something, being that I'm not on the budget uh, committee. I think that Councilwoman Gilmore basically has said it all. But I'm, I'm a little frustrated because I've been going from mad to sad as I sit here and listen to the dialogue that has been going on. Um, we've got to do better as a city. And we should be ashamed that we would allow an organization like In Full Motion to continue to beg in one hand and, and asking and, and, and going out scrapping, trying to support these children that need it the most. The best of us should help the rest of us. There's disparity, huge disparities. And we don't need to turn a blind eye to it. We need to do the right thing. I wanted to say something about 50 Forward because they are such a wonderful organization and they serve people all over this county. But so many of the colleagues were saying it, so I decided maybe I won't. But in full motion deserves the exact same respect. You know, they say if you give a child, an investor child today, a dollar today, keeps them from stealing one from you later when they become older. Used to be when they become an adult. But now it, they don't get to be 18, 19, 20 years old. I look at the statistics in the metro school system, and we've got 78% of our children graduating but only 21% of them are college ready. We need to fix that. They can't understand science if they can't read. And we gotta start doing it now. And the people on this council need to do the right thing. It's time. It's always, always the right time to do things now when they're wrong and they're broken. It's time to fix them now. We don't need to wait any longer. Second Harvest has a $30 million budget. 
30, we asking for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The city just got fifty million dollars from this past week with the predators. Has that money already been spent? We got to help our people. That's why we're here. We need to do the right thing, people. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Councilman Foley. You would call on me after that speech. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I can say now. I've got a couple of questions I wanted to ask. Um, procedurally, if, um, if we pass this amendment, Mr. Jamison, you can help me here. Uh, I think I understood you, but I want to be clear. Uh, it wipes the 50,000 50, out and replaces it with the 250,000, or it adds to it? It adds to it. So it would be a total of $300,000. No, it adds to what's in the substitute. The 50 that's in the substitute, this adds 200 to that, so a total of 250. Okay, all right. So uh, procedurally moving forward, I know the Budget Committee passes uh, amendments in the substitute, and then Council weighs in on it again uh, tomorrow night. Correct. And they will have an opportunity to go through this like we did? Is that up correct? Up and down on each one, yes, Not sir. on each one, just up or down? Yes, sir. Okay. So... Uh, now I'd like to ask you, Ms. Fitzgerald, yes. the question. So tell me about uh, how $50,000 would impact you. We would definitely not reduce the quality of our expansion. It would reduce the numbers to 50 children. Reduce the numbers to 50 that you could serve as opposed to 200? 250 children. Okay. And what we're trying to do is reach all clusters where middle school kids have the problem right now in not even entering ninth grade. So while we think we can wait to give them some college ready focus and skills, ACT, Forgotten Middle School Longitudinal Study shows to the early intervention will keep the student on track to enter and enroll in college. And that's the model that we're following on the American College Testing Incorporated. Thank you very much. I, I do want to commend uh, Councilmember Davis for his advocacy on this part, and I do uh, appreciate your program. I've had the opportunity with you and uh, Coach Fitzgerald to take a deep dive into it, and very much appreciate what you're uh, doing over at Info Motion. Uh, I do have a concern. I just want to make sure that uh, uh, we're not uh, pricing you out of the range for support for uh, uh, the requisite number of council members here. So that would be the big concern I have about uh, moving it from 50,000 to 250,000. So thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Dowell, there we are. Thank you. I, I want to make two comments. One, and this doesn't necessarily pertain to Ms. Fitzgerald, but it pertains to the city investment in youth, I heard someone say that we don't spend enough money investing in youth, and I, I disagree, um, because we give, we have about a $2 billion budget, a billion of it goes to the metro school system. And I would say that's an investment in youth, because most of the people who participate in our public school system are young people. So I do believe we invest in our young people. And second, we also fund the NASA program. Mm -hmm. um, we also have funded Opportunity Now. We fund our parks and recreation, and, and I could go on. This second harvest food program, part of this money goes to funding meals for children in the summertime, who we know, many kids who attend school, that's the only time they eat, and in the summertime, a lot of them do go hungry, and they go to emergency food banks like the ones that are located out in my district. So for those, you know, who are not familiar with it, I want to disagree. I think Ms. Fitzgerald has a wonderful program, and I've been in awe of it since I heard about it. Um, I think we should fund it. However, I think we have to be cautious about funding things on an a la carte basis. We're going to give you 200000 this year, and then what happens next year? Organizations that come forward to us, people say this all the time, and I've had this discussion with them, is that a lot of organizations you see get funded from year to year because they have their paperwork wiped. They have their strategic plan, and they're working toward a goal. So when they come before the city, they're saying, in five years, I want to be here. In seven years, I want to be here. In 10 years, I want to be here. 
They have their financial papers in order. They're showing that they're growing their donor base. They're showing that they're getting private funding to almost quadruple what we're giving for government funding. And this is some of the same things that people who review grants from year to year to year to look at. And I've agreed to work with Ms. Fitzgerald with some contacts that I have to get her on a path of sustainability and funding. But we give the school system, this is what bothers me, is we give the school system a billion dollars worth of funding, part, and I'm saying part of our sidewalk money and all this other stuff go with it when I come up with that number. And, you know, I, I battled this because isn't it the school responsibility to prepare these young people for this test and prepare them for success going forward? I don't understand why this is not part of the MNPS budget. I don't understand why we're talking about cutting Second Harvest and Adventure Science Center, which service a lot of children that I know that do not have opportunity to go and participate in the science program. Why are we talking about cutting them uh, to fund another program? And we have uh, $2 billion, a billion dollars going over here toward MNPS, who we all agree, we have two schools on the list, the graduating students who, as someone said, a lot of them are not prepared to go to college and can't get in college because of their test scores. Why isn't this included in their budget? Why aren't we having the conversation about taking $200,000 from NMPS and, and funding a program for Ms. Fitzgerald to go into the school systems and work with those students who go to those schools and help them prepare to pass this ACT exam and raise their test scores? Because that's, in essence, what the school system should be doing in their senior year. And I'll tell you, I went to Chattanooga Public Schools in Hamilton County. My senior year, we had ACT prep. It was done at my high school on Saturday. And, and so, you know, I don't know who paid for it. I did, and I went free. The taxpayers paid for it. I didn't have any money coming out of my pocket paying for it. But I don't understand why our MMPS has not made a commitment to a program that prepares them for school. And I don't understand either on the other side is why after 10 years of operating this organization that this is where we are, that you're not included in MMPS budget, that for the last couple of years you've come in and asked for emergency funding for a program. This should be funded. It should be part of MMPS budget. It should be year to year. We should have a strategic plan. We should see the donor base growing and private funding. And, and we should have something. But you know, we're here again and we don't. Now we can fund it this year, but what happens next year? You don't get the 200,000 or 250,000 and going forward. And I asked again that as we sit here and make these decisions, that we think about sustainability, that we think about what happens next year, that we think about, you know, organizations that have their paperwork and their information and their plan together so that we can sustain them versus giving them something, and then next year they find themselves in the same spot coming down here. Um, so I do support, you know, your organization. I do think nonprofits have to grow at a certain level, just like the hospital or anybody else. You can't serve everybody and be everything to everybody. You have to grow responsibly, and that's with a business or anything. So you may not be able to service 250 kids. You may have to service 100 kids and grow it with your, your, your donors and grow it with your grant money and grow it with your investment from year to year to service more. But um, I would support wholeheartedly taking 250,000 from MNPS to fund this because it's worthy of it. But I do have some concerns about taking it from Second Harvest and the Venture Science Center um, to fund it because this is a school-related MNPS education expense and this is where it should come out of. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Council Lady Vircher. Right, there we are. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, um, I want to reel it back in. Um, I want to echo some of the same sentiments that Council Lady uh, Gilmore, Council Lady Hurt, uh, my fellow Councilman um, Nick Leonardo. This program does tremendous work in this city. What they're asking for, um, we've given more to organizations in this city that's demonstrated much less. And I just want to be frank, um, like they say on the streets, I'm going to keep it real. They are going to places and dealing with a population in our city that some of these organizations that receive our city funding, they do not want to deal with. <clears throat> they provide, they, they have proven services to the most needy in this city. And I want to clarify, this is not an emergency ask. 
They're not coming in here asking for emergency funding. They're coming in here to ask us to help them better serve this city, in which they're already doing. You know what I do as a profession. An associate director of financial aid at Tennessee State University. Test scores is the end all, be all for this demographic. It is, and that's just the world that we, we're in. That's just the, the higher education arena. Test scores can define um, on, on where you land in life. Um, this organization, Ms. Fitzgerald, um, her volunteers, they're not asking for us to, to bail them out. They're asking us to expand their program, which not just benefits the city, but it benefits everyone. The universities, um, Tennessee State University is a benefactor of this program. Uh, Fisk University, some of the other universities, they are expanding their collaboration and partnerships with the universities here in the city. So I'm trying to appeal to your heart. Let's get beyond um, um, where, we're, where we're taking the, the funding from. They are meeting the community where they're at. They're meeting some of the most vulnerable where they're at. And, and I'll say again, um, we've given more to some organizations that have proven less in this city. And I ask that uh, you support this amendment. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, Councilman Karen Johnson. Thank you, Chair Cooper. I will just be short. <laughs> um, Info motion came before the school board when myself and Steve Glover were on the school board and they have been asking to be included in the budgets for NASA and other organizations that um, receive funding and support from the mayor's office. Um, and this is not targeting Mayor Barry in any way. This is before her. Listening to Council Lady Gilmore and her talking about when did Adventure Science Center get the funding. Metro invested in them initially which helped the Adventure Science Center to grow, to be where it is today. I actually sat on the board of the Adventure Science Center. So I know the budget very well with the Adventure Science Center. And it is hugely supported by philanthropic and foundation support from corporations. They have a tremendous amount of money and resources, the board members themselves are CEOs and top executives of the top companies in our city. So this little small amount of money is not going to even make a dent in the Adventure Science Center's ability to be able to continue to service the children who they service uh, to the Adventure Science Center. And I wouldn't go on the record saying this if I didn't know for a fact that this funding being pulled, I don't believe in any way would hurt the Adventure Science Center. My sorority, we just recently volunteered at the Second Harvest Food Bank. And the feedback that I received when I was there was that they have a surplus they have, they have donations coming in, a lot, a lot of volunteers, and there's no way you can compare them to a small organization like In Full Motion. They have the resources, they have the board members, they have access to funds that In Full Motion do not. The ACT, PrEP being offered at the middle school level will enable children who traditionally are in the cohort of dropout and suspension rates that have been high for minority children. You heard a lot of them come here 
and express that because of being a part of Influ Motion, it gave them hope and they felt as though they could excel and succeed in school. So I ask you to consider supporting this amendment. We just gave 50 forward $150,000. And we all committed to do the same thing in supporting in full motion. And so again, I just want to reiterate that I was a board member for Adventure Science Center. And I know that this in no way will hurt their ability to continue to be able to service the children that they serve. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair. I may have written some things down wrong. You know, I like the numbers. So the $400,000 operational budget you're utilizing now, is that serving 400 students or 1,000 students? It's serving 1,000 students, but the majority of those students are 80% high school students, which studies have shown by Metro National Public Schools and the T Tennessee Department of Education that we're giving the preparation too late. Nobody has even talked about the point that we are in Metro Nashville Public Schools starting with the 11th grade, given a state test, but the scores are still so, so low because there's a gap. That's a service gap between the 7th and 8th graders and getting to the 11th grade for minority students, for low-income students, and for students who are attending what are classified as economically disadvantaged schools. We want to close that gap. We're going to still have a high school program that still continue, can, continues, like Council Lady Dowell said, to help in the 12th grade and 11th grade. But we have to get funds to enter the arena that's actually not producing ninth graders anymore, the middle school. There's crime that this will clearly show after school programs, summer programs, and Saturday programs for fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders will make a substantial impact in dropout rates for ninth grade students. Okay, so here's where my confusion lies. Why does it cost $400 here, but yet if we give you $250,000 additional money, you can only service uh, 250 students, so it moves to $1,000. Yes, so that's sir. where that's where the confusion for me lies, because if I do the math very quickly, it says, well, with 50,000, you'd be able to add 125. I mean, just mathematically, it's not, I can't make two and two equal four here. Councilman, um the difference is an after-school program is 28 weeks. Our model provides certified teachers in math, science, reading, and English. The prior model of 400,000 a year is Saturday classes only. Okay, okay. That, that answers that. Thank you, thank you for the clarification. Thank, thank you, Chair. You, Councilman, uh, Councilman Henderson. Thank you, Chair Cooper. I, I think Councilman Glover was, was getting at um, my my question as far as the uh, the the population and the time frame that they were being served. Um, I found the young people who came to speak to us very compelling, and I really do appreciate uh, the work uh, that you are doing. I do have some concerns similar to Council Lady Dowell's in that with this increase, it's about a 62% increase in your funding. Um, and do you find then from a that's from a scale standpoint or that's just taking it to the everyday as opposed to Saturday? Um, I just I get a little concerned in the nonprofit community when you have that huge bump, you know, how do you sustain that if you haven't sort of built into your fundraising model of, you know, what are your additional grants you're going to be seeking? What are the, you know, the individual? I know your fundraising has largely been corporate partners, not individuals. And I know it costs money to raise money. So I guess I just wonder about sustainability. Um, if you make this big a jump um, in one year and why half, you know, if we funded 50 forward at an additional $150,000, what would you do with $150,000 as opposed to 250? And, and how are you looking at growing and sustaining that? Well, the great uh, collaboration has been with NASA 
And we went into the middle school program through NASA Anchor Partners, although we funded Saturday programs at several middle schools, including East, uh, Two Rivers, and McKissick. But once we got in the NASA program with the quality standards and looking at the process of 28 weeks per year, plus a, set, uh, a boot camp kind of summer program, and four days a week after school programming, the expenses are based on the NASA model. It has worked for us. We're going into our third year as a NASA anchor partner. But of course, the NASA slots are very far and, and, and hard to come by. We have applied for funding and a proposal to NASA. We have uh, expectations, of course, will be continued to be funded for 15 slots, but we understand that the additional funding for NASA will not accommodate our expansion to just the low performing economically disadvantaged listed schools that we intend to serve. So we do have with uh, Council Lady Dowell working through uh, strategic planning through an also a grant process. We have several fundraisers scheduled that will include increased funding but once we get the results through our after school program, we anticipate that the results, bringing back to you, the council, metro government, whomever that would request to look at our matrix, will be able to fund continuously based on the increase uh, out outcomes to college readiness for our high school students in those clusters. Thank you. Okay, so your need in this year then is to, to grow the program. To grow the middle school. To grow the middle school aspect of the program. Did you um, request funding through Metro in the past, through the community? Um, I can never remember all our different acronyms. Uh, we have requested on uh, two occasions. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, again, if you look at the competitors in the CEF, now new name program, you're dealing with high education. You're competing with 50 to 100 year organizations and you're actually learning through the process. So our goal is to definitely participate in the new process. This year we weren't able to get in based on the change in transition year. So we anticipate, yes, continuing to pursue all grant opportunities. So do you feel like this funding is sort of a catalyst or a bridge to where you wanna go and then you could back down off that you know, I mean, oh, yes, ma'am. Like it is a catalyst. The expectation of, um, but I mean, to Council Lady Dow's point from a strategic planning standpoint and a development perspective, like, you know, you're going to have to grow that. And you feel confident about that? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. I, I often talk about, you know, my experience as an attorney and going from JC Napier Homes and not scoring so high myself because this supplemental program we provide costs from $1,200 to $3,000 to $4,000 from Princeton Review to, to Silver Learning. Our, our students, our families with scarce resources cannot get this during the school day. This is an after school program, a summer program, and a Saturday program. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Council Lady Haywood, if I can get this machine to work. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like, as uh, Council Lady Johnson said, number one, to be extremely brief because everything that I could possibly say has already been said. But I would like to say that since uh, birth was given to this program, I watched it uh, being birthed. I strongly believe in this program. I've watched it grow. I've watched it mature. I've seen the Fitzgeralds put a lot of love and patience into this and passion, above all, into this program. Um, hopefully my two grandkids will uh, attend the program in a few weeks. I believe in the program. I think the program is worthy of our time, our attention, and the dollars that are being requested. I think if we, when we talk about the second harvest, everyone has to eat, but I think if you give the kids a fish, they'll eat for a day, but if you teach them to fish 
they are eat for a lifetime. And as a retired educator, I've even taught in the program, not in full motion, but I know that the kids that experience extracurricular programs, supplemental programs, are generally more successful than the other kids. And I, I would just like to say that I strongly, strongly, <laughs> as strongly as I possibly can, endorse in full motion and prayerfully I hope the request will be honored. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Councilman Pridemore, if I can get this to work. Here we are. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. You know, we don't get paid enough. Uh, that's my first. Uh, the the <laughs> I do I, I do want to make a few comments, and all of them, believe it or not, are probably good. I was impressed uh, the other night during a public hearing with uh, within motion. I was impressed with the testimony from from the students, and I was impressed in, in, in the way they conducted themselves much better than some of the adults that were there that evening. So I want to give them accolades for that. And I was impressed for a lot of the advancements that they have made. Uh, I hate to say it, I think one or two uh, the scores were higher than mine. So uh, anyway, um, but I do want to say, and I agree with all the comments made here tonight. My heart goes out to every, each individual councilman and the, and the passion we all have for children and for the cause. And there were some comments made that I want to make sure that, yes, they work. Uh, uh, there is a lot of, um, uh, I guess, funding for other organizations. But also, you know, it was stated by uh, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, that 96% of their fund uh, is, is their money is funded, is donated through foundations. So, you know that comes in both directions, and and and, and I and that's how you got to live today. These foundations, I mean, these uh, some of these nonprofits have to have donations, and I understand that. Uh, that's how you survive. Um, and with that, but so is the. Uh, the uh, Adventure Science Center, and so is the Second Harvest Food Bank. But also, 60% of Metro Nashville's budget, what we're, we are discussing now, is going toward children. And I understand I stepped out of the room, but I, I think uh, Council Lady, my colleague, Council Lady Dow, covered most of that, so I won't go over that. Also, the mayor's summer program. What is that for? That's for children. So to say we're not... We're, we're leaving, we're, we're not taking care and thinking of our children. I disagree with that. And, and I, uh, another thing, I, Ms. Fitzgerald, I want to ask you, uh, have you ever, has the organization in motion ever uh, applied for the Community Enhancement Fund? Yes, we have. Okay, and the result, were you, were you funded? No, we were not. We were close, I think, within three points from making the top 10 list. And sometimes there are those issues of questions of sustainability and capacity for a small, growing organization. Every organization, nonprofit, started somewhere. We started in 2005. We've grown. We've grown to be available for high school students with no hope where they face a 14 on the ACT in their 12th grade year. And I asked one of the council uh, members the other night, who do you turn away? So with this funding, we will build a base of middle school students, but at the same time be available and be that catalyst to eventually show school districts, the schools, uh, Metro uh, Council, whoever it is, this this is not our model. This is from the ACT. In other states, in other counties, even in Tennessee, there is funding for organizations like us to make a difference. The scores have been flat in, in increasing but, high school ACT uh, scores. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, ma'am. And you, 
You don't have to convince us. Okay. We're convinced. Thank you. I don't think there's one here that isn't convinced. So you can, uh, uh, we, we thank you for that. Thank you. But when it comes down to what I, this is a tough decision for every council member. And what I propose, and I'm not an attorney, but I, with all the attorneys we have here, they should be very familiar with this. I would like to propose a compromise in making sure that that uh, uh, the programs close to our hearts and the ones that uh, we see uh, are in need by this community are served. And so I'm, I am suggesting that uh, uh, why not uh, make a, uh, I may make a motion to reduce the funding from two hundred fifty thousand dollars to a hundred thousand uh, dollars. That way, fifty thousand from each of the uh, fund that is uh, identified here as being um, uh, as being identified as as one serving to uh, I hate to wait take from, but to to uh, retract some of their funds from. So with that. I think uh, I would like to make that motion to uh, hundred thousand dollars, fifty thousand from each. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, I believe you have to suspend the rules. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, um, I should know that, shouldn't that. I? Uh, well, it's a long night, and this <laughs> not even Tuesday yet. Um, so I request to suspend the rules. the rules. Is there any objection to suspension of the rules? Here. It takes two. Yes. All right. We have three. Yes. Okay. We'll we'll continue to discuss. We'll continue. Thank continue you. to discuss. Um, uh, and you're, I'll finish, Councilman. Um, uh, Council Lady uh, Mina Johnson. Thank you. I have a, a quick question. Uh, I mean, like everybody said, nobody's questioning worthiness of uh, information, and everybody want to find the money. The question is where we can take the money from. That's the toughest in our heart. So in regards to that, uh, this uh, Adventure Science Center, it says appropriation uh, pursuit, person to TCA 73314. Could you... Uh, Finance or legal department uh, talk what our requirement of the TCA regulation. Are we required to fund 200000 to Science Center, or are we required to fund a portion of, or what is the exact requirement? In, in terms of the Adventure Science Center, I think it's an actual charter requirement where the um, I think it was referred to as the Cumberland Science Museum at that time, uh, receive a $15,000 appropriation. So you could not drop below that level. Is that, John, you want to add anything? Nodding, everything's okay. So we can amend that 200000 too if we don't drop below that requirement. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman, uh, Council Lady. Uh, Council Lady Wiener. Thank you. I, too, want to propose a compromise, and my compromise is going to be that we reduce the amount equivalent to the 150 that we've given 50 forward. And so that would be the proposal that I would make. I, too, would need to suspend the rules in order to make that happen. All right. There's a motion to suspend the rules. Second. Second to suspend the rules. Um, any, obje any objection to suspending the rules? All right. There's no objection to suspending the rules. The amendment to the amendment is to change, just so that we follow this along, uh, to $150,000. And y your amendment to reach the $150,000 total is to take 50 from both Second Harvest and the Adventure Science Center. Yes. Yes. Okay. To make 150, that is the um, suspended of the rules amendment to the amendment, um, and I see lots of um, yes. people want to discuss this. Okay. Sorry, uh, folks. No, no, um, Councilman Glover, I'll call the question. Um, are we allowed to do this? There, yes, you're allowed to do it. Take a vote. Okay. All in favor. All in. 
favor of the previous question, which is the amendment to the amendment for $150,000 to um, in full motion. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Um, the amendment to the amendment is passed, and now we're back to the original amendment. No, she, no. she's oh, just sorry. taking the vote on the discussion. Oh, oh. Now you have the vote. Yeah, the actually, amendment. I called now the we question. Have the vote on the amendment. Yeah. All right. Uh, oh. Now we have the vote on the amendment. All, All in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. And that handles um, number nine. Am amendment number eight, and we are on to amendment number nine. Yes. Yes, Council Lady. I just want to make sure that we, we got the results that we that we were uh, striving for to quantify that amount. So the total appropriation is with this amendment is 150,000 in addition to the 50,000 that's already in the substitute total in 200,000. No, no, it's a, a total of 150. A total of 150,000 with 50,000 coming from the Adventure Science Center appropriation and 50,000. Um, from Second Harvest appropriation and 50000 through the juvenile court. Thank you, Chair. Um, and then also I want to remind uh, council people that every amendment is voted on tomorrow night. Uh, every amendment. Um, all right, now I see um, discussion items here. Councilman Glover, are you set? Okay, I should clear you? Yes. Okay, all right, and then Councilman Davis, did you have a comment? The goal was to um, put 150,000, okay, and then to add in the 50 that was already there to give it a total of 200. Not what the emotion was. Well, I'm sorry. It should have been 75 for each. Well, that's not what the motion was. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, and I think we encountered as Mr. Jamison that before we get to rec recall the vote, we have to do it before he, before the chair moves on. Is that correct? Correct. So, will a member of the committee have to do that? You should reconsider, but you need. Move the reconsider. I'm sorry. But he's already. He's already. Okay. Already moved to amendment nine. Is it? Um, I think I think the words had come out of my mouth that we had moved on to amendment nine. Um, every amendment, however, is voted on again tomorrow night. So, what what passed is the recommendation for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Correct. As per Council Lady Weiner's, uh, yes, Vice Chair Vircher. Chair, I, I can clearly state there was confusion in the amendment given that, that the discussion on the current amendment was adding the $250,000 in addition to the $50,000 that was already in the substitute. The committee, I believe, was thinking they were voting on $150,000 in addition to the $50,000 that was already in the substitute. They can offer that tomorrow. Well, um, one that can be offered tomorrow, and um, uh, two, I think, in Council Lady Weiner's amendment to the amendment, she said $150,000, uh, and the two sources of $50,000, uh, of additional $50,000 from the juvenile court was identified, and um, the total amount of Amendment 8 was always $250,000. But again, this can be amended tomorrow night. Okay, I'm seeing, all right, I see other people in the queue. Yes, Councilman Glover? Yeah, okay, so Mr. Jamison, just a point of order here. So if tomorrow night, Council Lady Weiner, who made the motion, or can, can it be any particular councilman, because help me understand tomorrow night on these, these amendments, because it was amended here on the floor, are we still going to have to ask for suspension of the rules tomorrow night? Yes. Okay. So at that point, does Council Lady Weiner, or for that matter, again, any council member have the opportunity to amend, quote, the amendment? Yes. Okay. The committee members, I don't think that's not going to be relevant. Tomorrow night is the full council meeting, correct? Correct. If we suspend the rules. 
if for all of this, there's a suspension right. of the rules. Right. Right. So, uh, and, and it'll still come because, I, I, and again, just making sure I understand uh, the process for tomorrow night. Each one of these amendments that we've either voted up or voted down tonight will come in the same order tomorrow night. Correct. Will require suspension of the rules if any amendments were made to them whatsoever, and I believe they all have had amendments made to them. Almost all, correct. Okay. And so if that's the case, then each one would require suspension of the rules. So if tomorrow night, if council, and I'm going to just go ahead and say Council Lady Weiner for the sake of, 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 of keeping the same person in play. Uh, if Council Lady Weiner so chooses to come back with a 7575 and then bunch the 50 that's already in there, she would have that opportunity yes. as long as two people did not uh, uh, disagree with it right. or didn't didn't uh, object to. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Chair. All right. Thank you. Uh, working down um, the list. Is this more discussion on this, or are we are we're on nine? Right. Sorry, Councilman Mendez. Let, let's say, following Councilman Glover's hypotheticals, that. Uh, uh, Council Lady Weiner tries to suspend the rules and fails. Um, and then um, uh, Councilman Davis's original amendment, um, does what we've just done constitute the Budget and Finance Committee having considered that amendment? Yes, the rule does not require a vote by the Budget and Finance Committee. It just requires consideration by. You've considered the original and you've right, considered thanks. it as amended. Okay. Um. All right, um, back to Councilman Davis. Did you have a comment? <laughs> I think our intent as a caucus is we're going to suspend the rules, put in the extra. Put in the extra fifty thousand dollars. Okay, excellent. Uh, all right, and then Councilman Bedney. This is totally unrelated, but the planning and commission was supposed to start at six. It's Council Lady Allen's wedding anniversary. We have two staff members from planning sitting in the back. So can I ask the can I ask the council to consider putting planning before budget next time that there is a full agenda? That way people don't have to wait. Fortunately I have to leave, so I want to be on the record that I came to the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Um, excellent sub suggestion. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, on to Amendment 9, uh, uh, by myself, it's a technical correction moving to Amend 722. Um, there has been money appropriated for the, um, uh, through the Public Defender's Office for a funding of the JFON PIP, I'm just putting this in colloquial words, and for the funding of legal aid. This amendment, uh, based on the opinion of Metro Legal, it means that it, that money no longer has to flow through the Public Defender's Office, but in fact can go directly from this. Again, it's a technical uh, amendment for that. Uh, amendment number nine, um, it's been put on the desk. Uh, is there a motion? Moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Councilman Mendez? I know it's uh, skipping ahead, and I don't think um, this question might uh, might not be until we consider the substitute as amended. Um, but um, it has to, the question has to do with the various funding sources that uh, um, were in the substitute. And my question, uh, Mr. Chair, is whether all of the places where money was taken from um, are in agreement with that. Um, and for example, I know there's an entrepreneur center um, uh, that got knocked down from 250 to 125. And uh, um, feedback I heard from them this afternoon is uh, that that uh, puts uh, maybe a 5% dent in their budget and, and uh, um, raises the question about the rest of these funding sources, whether they're um, by agreement, not just with finance, but with the agencies um, that are having the funds reduced. And that, and that relates to this amendment where um, since there isn't a requirement to provide funding to the um, Public Defender's Office, um, these two things are, are dollar amounts that um, might matter to the agencies that are being reduced. Um, well, again, I'm deferring a little bit to the technical side that, that in expressing it, the idea is to, 
to move it separately. Um, you mentioned the Entrepreneur Center, and I think that is right, um, that they're not completely happy with this. Um, and just to have a, I know we've all been here a long time, a brief discussion, and particularly keying off of the last discussion, the Entrepreneur Center also receives free rent on its 20,000 square feet, um, probably a six or $700,000 a year subsidy, and will receive free rent for the next 46 years. So in terms of cutting its cash subsidy back a little bit, that, that seemed in the measure of things uh, not completely inappropriate. Of the people that I've heard back from on the sources, I would say that's the source that was the clearest they, they were not happy about that. And, and just to push back a little bit, um, they're, when we say they're not entirely happy, that means they're unhappy. And when we say carving their cash back a little bit, we mean 50%? No, they raise, uh, I believe, talking to them today, about $2.3 million. So this would change their budget, most of which is privately funded, not different than the last discussion, by, again, uh, about 5% from uh, Metro funding 10% of their budget to 5% of their budget. Um, it's not, I bring this up in that it's not inconsistent with our previous discussion about other items, but um, this is not a sources and uses environment in the sense that it is uh, not obligating the public defender to be a pass-through, as that is a bit probably poor precedent. It does honor the overall precedent, however, of 70 of the 75 percent. And, and so I, I guess I'll, I'll ask uh, maybe the administration table. Uh, I mean, what I understand developed this afternoon is that um, it's not a line item by line item that if you give a dollar, uh, a new dollar to um, the DA, you have to um, find 75 cents for the public defender, that it's looking at the overall new dollars for each agency in the fiscal year, and that with uh, at a $350,000 increase for the DA's office, the total amount of money that's going to the PD that's new in this year's budget is meeting the 75% requirement for the new money that's going to the DA's office. And there is uh, no requirement uh, to fund anything in or if we give the $350,000 to the DA's office. Am I right about that? Well, let me, let me defer to to Metro Legal, again, it's been, been their interpretation that we've been following the last several years. Yes, days. so our opinion is that you, you look at the total new dollars being allocated to each agency, as you described. Um, it will depend on the amount of the pay plan allocation um, based on our uh, Rough calculations this afternoon, it looked like the 75% was, was going to be met or be very close. Um, but yeah, it, it's not a, a, if you give a dollar here, you have to give 75 cents you know, of, of new money over and above the substitute. And, and so just to follow up on that, for these particular things, um, the, again, while JFON's great and Legal Aid's great, um, I've participated with both organizations, the, we don't need to um, give money to any of those agencies or the public defenders to have the $350,000 to the DA's office be legal, right? I, I don't know enough of the details about how they work. If part of the J fund, is that what it is? If part of that allocation is actual um, public defender personnel, then that would count towards the the seventy five percent. I yeah, I understand the state law about the seventy five percent is um, if it's uh, the funding is used for the purpose of indigent and criminal defense. And the way I understand the PIP is that it would be a joint representation situation where uh, public defenders, lawyers would be providing the uh, criminal defense and the immigration services related to that for certain defendants would be provided by JFON. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, your question is, it, is it legally required that funds be appropriated to these organizations? No. Well, and so I heard one of my colleagues mention, so why are we doing it? Um, I, I, I think to, to be clear, and, and I'm open to being corrected, the 
when there was an understanding a week ago when you were out of town, <laughs> Mr. Cooper, um, that uh, uh, we had to come up with 75% of the 350, that's where the idea for giving money to these two agencies came from. I think the current thinking is, um, as I understand what developed this afternoon, is there's probably at least a couple different arguments um, that uh, no additional funding is required to any agency, public defender or otherwise, if we give 350 to the DA's office. So, so these are, um, to, to include JFON and um, legal aid is um, really, uh, it's, it's not necessary at this point. You know, if, if we were doing it, it would be because we value them over the things that we're taking money from on the, on the uses side of the equation or the sources side. I think that's right. Mr. Jameson. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't know you're asking me, but yes, I agree with that. Um, and I mean, I, I guess I'm not uh, uh, necessarily expressing an opinion, but I want to make sure everybody understands. We we don't have to do this 150 for JFON or the 1125 for Legal Aid Society to be legal with the the 350 for the DA's office. That um, you know, there's been a little bit of a shifting understanding over the last week. You know, that money could theoretically be available for something else. It could be available to return money from to the sources, um, but it doesn't have to go to these. Two agencies to, to make the 350 for the DA's office work. Correct. That, I think that's the, as you said, shifting understanding. Right. Um, Councilman Pulley. Well, Councilman, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Councilman Mendez drilled down on a lot of what I was going to ask. Uh, to be clear, um, you're stating, Mr. Cooper, that the allocation given to the public defender's office through the other budget process, not within the framework of this substitute, satisfies the 75% requirement that we are statutorily required to provide. Is that your position? Based on the, again, it'll depend on the, um, the amount allocated for pay plan, but based on the initial rough calculations that we were able to do very quickly, it looks like that's the case um, without the the money for the nonprofits. I mean, the, uh, from a legal standpoint, our position is that you cannot count funds to a nonprofit organization as part of the 75% statute. So what does the 75% statute tell us? Where, the, where does it say we have to provide it this? It says that if... You, that if the district attorney receives an increase for personnel or office expenses, that you must provide at least 75% of that to the public defender. So specifically to the public defender's office? Correct. And uh, this was arrived at, these two agencies were arrived at specifically to satisfy that 75% requirement I when this was... Uh, Negotiated? I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Uh, that probably a question for the chair. Well, I think Councilman Mendez captured it. There's been an evolving understanding. And initially last week, it was viewed that it was required and that this was a potential way of doing it. I think, again, I'm looking at the administration table, that the funding level, however, of the public defender's office is good enough that we, in fact, have extra space and this no, I get that I understand that I'm just wondering how we uh, as a council arrived at making this decision for the public defenders to where this money is going to be allocated well in um, in that there was not a pay problem in the public defender's office that um, but that you needed to provide this it's still it's based on the view that the 75 percent was a requirement but also now it was not viewed that the funding level, that it had to be of all new money, and I believe now the interpretation is it's based on the basic funding level as opposed to new money only. And the 262.5 was an effort to comply with the 75 percent. I'm just concerned that we may be setting a dangerous precedent moving in this direction of picking the agencies for the public defender's office, because I'm not sure they well, had a... Actually, uh, cures that. actually, this amendment cures that. I think your concern and the concern expressed by the public defender's office was that it was a poor precedent and that's, this is the cure, that the Friday's method of doing it 
is a concern, and this is an effort to be a cure. Do you want to speak to that, Mr. Cooper? That's correct. All right. Um, the only other thing I would say is uh, Ms. Diener has been sitting here for four hours over there uh, listening to all this lovely conversation about other amendments, so maybe you might want to weigh in on this uh, at all, or are you happy just sitting here listening? I, I think um, Council Cooper, uh, John Cooper of Metro Legal, uh, has expressed what my concerns were, that, that this was uh, a problem precedent. Uh, and as he has explained how the 75% calculation has been uh, done by Metro over the past several years is consistent. So that's consistent with what Metro has done over the last four or five years in terms of making sure it's, it feels it's meeting its 75% obligation. Are you satisfied that the amendment uh, uh, addresses any concerns moving forward about uh, how this was addressed initially? Yes, I haven't looked at it carefully, but Mr. Cooper showed it to me out in the hallway, explained to me what it does, and I'm satisfied with that. Okay. Nothing further from me. Thank you. Councilman Leonardo. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I just want to make sure that maybe I heard, and maybe I missed something here, but so the money that we were giving to JFON and the money that was going to go to legal aid is not required by law to give the district attorney's office a $350,000 raise. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So I think we're here tonight talking, I mean, those are great programs too. I mean, like Councilman Mendez, I've participated in these programs, but so if that's how we got here, what's the prohibition against taking that money and giving it back to the DA, which is why we're even having this discussion or making that kind of a motion? Is that present other legal issues or could that be a proposed? Be a proposed with a suspension of the rules amendment to the amendment. Okay, well, at, at this time I'd move to suspend the rules uh, to offer an amendment of, the, or an amendment of the amendment to take the money from JFON and Legal Aid Society and take back to the district attorney's office. That would result in a 75% problem. So what's the cutoff threshold financially on the 75% problem? It's, it's right at 350, I mean, we're, we're right at 15%, I mean, um, 75%. And it, give, or, give or take, and it'll, it'll depend on the, the uh, pay plan allocation, but it's, it's very, very close. It's much closer than in, in some previous years where um, we probably did not get to that 75% threshold. So if we did do something like that, then we would have the 75% problem. But right now Correct. we're okay, is what you're saying? Right now, based on our initial calculations, we think we're fine, yes. All right, thank you. And, it, and it's presumably a better precedent to handle it this way. Um, uh, Councilman Glover? Thank you, Chair. Uh, no particular question on this, but uh, I, w I just wanted to make sure that once we finish Amendment 9 here, that before we proceed with the uh, uh, moving the substitute as amended, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, we walk through the process and understand exactly uh, what we're to do tomorrow night for everybody just to make sure we're on board, how we're going to do it, et cetera. So that was just a, it's just a clarification. The of Amendment 9, we are not adjourning. So No, no, okay. <laughs> okay. We uh, are you are, sure? <laughs> we are not adjourning. Um, thank you, Councilman. Um, no, but we're not uh, adjourning. Council Lady Allen. It must be because it's getting past my bedtime, but I need to have this explained one more time. So the numbers that are here, 112500 to Legal Aid and 150000 to JFON, in the way that we've worded this, satisfy the 75% of the money that we want to give to the DA, and we have to give this amount. Is that what the, you the just said to, to Councilmember Leonardo? The better way to put it is that it doesn't trigger the 75% rule if you stay at 350, because the total new monies to the public defender are at least 75% of the total new monies to the DA. So we've satisfied the statute. Including this? By including this, yes. In the new monies. Okay, even though it's not, even though it's not salary or office equipment. It's new monies. New monies. Right. Okay, and that's all it is. Okay, and so if we don't give this, then we then we have the seventy-five percent problem, 
but we're just changing the language on how we say we provide it to them. Is if that? Go, if you go higher than 350, then you trigger the 75 percent because the new monies to the PD would not constitute the new monies to the mm -hmm. DA at 75 percent, counting the 350. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Okay, I think I, I understand it better than I did. So thank you. All right. Thank you. And then Councilman Pulley, did you have a comment? All right. Um, and Councilman Leonardo, back to you. So, Mr. Cooper, Mr. Jameson, is it possible that we could take $50,000 from J-Fund or $50,000 from legal aid and uh, have that apply to in motion at this time? Is that an amendment that could be made? Right. The, the, the concern is that the numbers remain at the DA at 350 or lower, but where the remainder goes, that's discretionary. So we can? Well, at this time, I'd, I'd make a motion to what? <clears throat> Correct. Okay. So that would be a, a motion okay. for, Thank for, you. For, for tomorrow night. Um, Council Lady Gilmore. I think we go, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. All right. And then C Council Lady Allen. Council Lady. All right. Um, that is the end of the queue, unless anyone else is seeking recognition. Um, Amendment 9 having been. Um, made and seconded. All in favor of Amendment 9, please say aye. aye. All opposed, Amendment 9. Um, all right, and then there is, um, um, while we're on stool 722, I want to ask for the indulgence of the committee for a moment to suspend the rules to offer an amendment. <coughs> there an objection. Okay. Here is my brief amendment so that it can be considered tomorrow night. Um, that the Historic Preservation Fund, as it is a priority of the mayor's and was in her uh, address, <coughs> State of Metro address, that the Historic Preservation Fund be restored to $250,000. And the source of that is from the Debt Retirement Fund, which I know we're all very protective of the $11 million number, that that $250,000 be shifted from that. Um, that motion is made so that we have the ability to consider it here tonight and then have that be part of a 10th amendment um, for tomorrow night's vote. You've moved for suspension of the rules. And I have moved for a suspension of the rules. Is there, there was no objection. Okay. And uh, is there a motion? So moved, seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed. So that gives us a 10th amendment for consideration tomorrow night for the refunding of the preservation money, which has been allocated to 50 forward. Um, uh, <clears throat> okay. Is there, any, is there any other business on 722? Yes. Councilman. Lover. Okay, so Mr. Jamison, let me just make sure that uh, it's been a long evening and I don't want to talk long, but let me make sure there's not an amendment here tonight that we've done that won't, will not require a suspension of the rules, is there? Um, that, I think that is correct from my notes. All right. So, so tomorrow night we'll be suspending the rules on each one of these amendments as we understand it right now. Of course, you'll look at it and you and the vice mayor will talk and we'll know for sure. So uh, of, of the number of amendments that look like it made it through tonight, how many total amendments will we actually be asking to suspend the rules on, please, sir? Just to quickly recite, one was withdrawn, two failed, three was approved, four failed, five was withdrawn, six was withdrawn, um, seven was adopted, eight was adopted, and nine and ten were adopted. So we've got a total of five? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Elrod. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the, uh, I have a question about it, and I'm going to ask the committee for an amendment to put the money back in, but in um, the general fund reductions, there was 173,600 that was with, uh, reduced from the public works general fund uh, functions transport increase, and that was to go to a um, 
planner and an engineer. And I was wanting to see what the thought was, is that those are two positions that we're going to go towards a division of transportation and some desperately needed planning that uh, Public Works um, was going to be using in conjunction with codes. And uh, I was wanting to see what the thought process on that was and to ask a, uh, I'm not a member of the budget committee, but to ask for a uh, similar amendment for that uh, 173 600 to be added back into the budget with the source being from the same uh, debt fund. Um, I, I don't know what he means by getting, uh, it's the, suspend the rules. I'm sorry, all. this is a request to suspend the rules for your amendment, okay? Uh, is there any objection? Se seeing none, uh, if you didn't mind, um, it's late. Would you restate your amendment? Oh, sorry. Here you are. The 173,600, 173,600 be um, put back to the um, 42 uh, public works. Uh, general fund functions transport increase. Um, originally, the number was 273,600. It was reduced down to 100,000. And uh, in talking with uh, Public Works tonight, I just found out this afternoon that's what the uh, reduction was for is to add simply two staff members to, uh, or full time employees, excuse me, to Public Works to uh, help. Uh, begin the, uh, I guess, creation of the Public Works Division of Transportation. Now, that was the uh, Division of Transportation that council members were su surprised about uh, the afternoon of our Public Works um, hearing. That notwithstanding, though, these are some important um, positions that I think we need um, because they are understaffed and, and as we're going forward on Public Works projects and also transit projects, um, so, so to put those, because right now with just 100000 they think they might be able to get one engineer tech. So um, more money is needed for that. So it was 173600 to come from the same fund that you mentioned so that we can consider that You've tonight. You've successfully suspended the rules. You've made the uh, amendment. And here's the discussion. Council Lady Henderson. Um, thank you, Chair. I guess it was just a, a point of order um, as to if Councilman Elrod is... Um, not a budget and finance committee member. Is that correct, Councilman Elrod? It has okay. To be seconded but by would, it, his motion I'm, would have to be seconded by a committee member. Okay. And I was, would second his amendment. You, or, yes, you, sir. you do second it? Yes. Yes, okay. So it is seconded by a budget and finance committee member. So it is a legitimate motion before the committee, and the rules have been suspended. But may I, <laughs> after. S yeah. Yes. The, doesn't the motion have to be made by a member of the committee? If it's seconded by a member of the committee, it's deemed to be that member's motion. So essentially it's Henderson's motion at this point. So you don't have to have two members of the committee, just one? Just a second by a member of the committee. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady? Um, thank you, Chair Cooper. Um, I, as to the, the source, I mean, I, I, I certainly appreciate um, your addition back to um, uh, historic from this mystery. Uh, could you could you explain the, the, the source a little more? Um, you, you mean on Amendment 10? Uh, yes, on the sir. Yes, sir. That's the $11.4 million special debt reserve fund um, that was the subject of Councilman Mendez's amendment for $5 million on the hospital. Okay. Um, well, sir, I, j I guess um, per Councilman Elrod saying he's not very concerned with the sort. I mean, do we have concern that that is a stretch right there to be doing well, the 250 in the first place? I don't, I mean, if, at that point, I don't want to have the huge pile on and just say, hey, let's pull it from that fund and that fund and that fund. So um, I do think this is an important position from a transportation planning perspective. Um, so I'm interested in seeing this position stay. Um, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with uh, the source. So I support the amendment to retain the funding for that position. Um, but I guess since we're a little on the fly here, uh, well, can I propose a different um, um, source? You mean to, to amend the amendment? <laughs> well... Is it my amendment, really, in the end, well, since I seconded it? 
You were the, the second. Because I'm a committee member. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's 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 the amendment okay. to your amendment. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, feel feel free. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, Chair Cooper, I guess my question prior to amending uh, my amendment <laughs> would be, uh, can we speak a little more, uh, Talia, to, from a source perspective, um, any concerns there in, in right. pulling from there? Is, is the question the term in terms of the funding source uh, being yes, recommended to come from the uh, debt service reserve? Yes, ma'am. Then I would just restate my earlier comments um, regarding um, uh, that amount that has been set aside for debt reserve is is a contingent amount and it's based on actual revenue collections. So I would be hesitant to. Um, appropriate the use of something that uh, we're being very careful around monitoring the actual revenues coming in and to the extent, and then the second item being to the extent that any of those appropriations for the debt service reserve are, um, are uh, reduced, that uh, will impact um, future capital spending plan uh, amounts that may be before the council. Okay, I appreciate that. I think then rather um, what I would, like to propose, um, since I think we've discussed at length um, earlier related to a, another amendment um, with the uh, regarding the property assessor's office, um, while it would not uh, fully fund both uh, of the transportation planning positions at the planner and engineer level two, um, I think it would fully fund um, one position and help with that work. Um, so my amendment then would be um, to restore um, to the Public Works Transportation increases um, 68,500 um, and to pull that from the property assessors for one additional property appraiser, um, which the additional one in the substitute budget um, provides them three and they've already been provided two in Mayor Berry's budget. And per our earlier discussions about that being for the 2021 um, reappraisal and our city being in compliance, um, that would be my amendment, please. Okay. All right, uh, made and second. Uh, just if you don't mind, I'm going to restate. Thank you, sir. So that we can be as as we understand it here, um, that you amending your amendment to provide uh, additional funds for the Department of Transportation. Public Works Department of Transportation effort to increase those funds by $68,500 and the source of that be from the property assessors increase FTE. Yes, sir, because okay. I feel like that's one position to another. It allows them to focus. Um, I think, you know, we okay. as a city are trying to have public works and planning working more collaboratively together and having planners um, working on our major transportation corridors, and that links to all the good work the administration then, we're trying to do. So I think the rules having been suspended, this is amendment number 11. We'll okay. refer to it as this. That's the specifics of the amendment having been made and seconded. We're ready for a discussion on amendment 11. All right. Uh, and Councilman Glover, you're in the I, I think that I, I just, I just was going to ask uh, the director of finance. I mean, that, that would have taken us up to $423,000. I don't like doing the 250 very candidly uh, because I think, we, I think we're entering into waters that we don't need to be swimming in. Uh, but uh, I, I get real nervous when, after we've said, no, we're not gonna do it on, from some, some areas. And now all of a sudden we're opening that door right back into it again. So that, that I don't really have anything else to say. I, I much prefer us doing it this way. Okay. Appreciate that, and then again to reiterate, all 11 amendments will have a vote t tomorrow night. Correct. Correct. All right. All. Uh, well, they'll all be presented. They're all presented, including the withdrawn ones, are are presented. Yes, all 11 were presented, and that's part of the purpose for suspending the rules and adding these amendments tonight, so that we can. Council Lady Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This, this is specifically on the amendment to the amendment to the substitute. Um, I, I'm looking at our, our wish list, and I don't see $400,000 worth of public works additions here. I see Council Member um, 
Brad Moore's uh, $140,000 for his roving trash truck. Well, but So I don't know where that came from. I, I would suggest that we take it from some public works money that we added that well, I don't remember anybody Chair asking Lady, for. Just, just to, f to, to foot back, the wish list doesn't foot to the substitute. The wish list is just the substitute. And in the substitute, the $400,000 came from uh, district cleanup, which was $50,000, uh, transportation, uh, crew improvements, two hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and uh, right right of way uh, crews, a hundred thousand dollars. And and who requested that? Well, um, Councilman Elrod's original wish list item was for funding of public works improvements that had not been funded fully in the mayor's budget. Mm -hmm. And then when you went through that list, public works and Mark Sturdivant particularly identified those areas gotcha. as his priorities, and there was simply not enough money to go further than that. So we added 400,000, and now we're adding another 123,000 right. for these other from positions. One of the funding sources, which was increased personnel uh, for DOT, FTE from Public Works, personnel are also being included by at MTA and planning for the future DOT. Right, and planning is funded, correct? Planning is that position was funded. funded. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I, I I would agree. It makes me nervous to continue to chip away at the at the reserve for the for the debt service. I think we need to be more mind. I mean, we spent a whole lot of time listening to the treasurer well, teach the, us about our debt service. This does not deal with that. The current source and use is very different. Correct. And I, okay. I applaud that. I would I would suggest that we maybe look at how much we've given them and chip away at some of that other. But that's just okay. my comment on the current amendment. Thank you. Okay. With well, that, that, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. That is the current amendment. And then back to the sponsor, Council Lady Henderson, did you have any last words? No. I did just want to restate the evolution of the amendment to the amendment that we are not talking about any debt <laughs> funds yes. at this juncture. We are just talking about the 68.5, um, pulling that from the suggested addition uh, to the properties assessors for one additional appraiser. Um, and if you'll look, I guess that our, uh, our uh, notes or analysis um, on this um, to achieve the third position for the property appraiser among the many things we reduced were staffing um, in public works related to transportation planning. Um, so I'm just saying aligned with Mayor Barry's goals and our goals as a council to focus on transportation, um, that um, there is more, in my view, immediate need in that regard to do some foundational planning and engineering work in our transportation corridors than there is to fund an additional appraiser in 2017-18 for the 2021 reappraisal. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Council Lady. Uh, on Amendment 11, Council Lady, Gil uh, Council Lady Gilmore. Um, while I do ap appreciate the uh, council members' efforts, at this point it looks like it's getting a little capricious, though. I'm not going to be able to um, su support it. I'm, I'm just not. Well, again, gonna. as Amendment 11, it will be before us tomorrow night, regardless of how we vote on it tonight. Um, all right. And then... Um, Councilman Davis. Uh, I just want to go on record stating that even though I'm not on this committee, thank you for being recognized, that I appreciate the council ladies' um, hard work in trying to find a solution. Uh, we need to be adding members to the assessor, not taking them away at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, council Lady Wiener. Thank you, Chair. I have to echo what Council Lady Gilmore shared. Um, I think we're kind of walking down a slippery slope here. How many more departments are we, we going to try to add back in at the 11th hour? And, um, and again, I'm, I appreciate where it's coming from. We have worked long and hard on setting up the most appropriate operating budget that we can. I seconded bringing it up for discussion so that we could share our thoughts, and I wanted to make sure to just um, give the caution that be careful what you're doing here. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, Council Lady Henderson, um, you're the last light on the queue. Okay. Um, I guess I just wanted to um, echo what uh, Council Lady Allen had said before. I sincerely appreciate the good work uh, of the assessor and her appraisers 
and it's not capricious in any way, but having participated in the budget work sessions, hearing the scoring of our wish list among an additional appraiser, I know uh, Councilman Scott Davis, I appreciate you wanting to support that department. That was among the things that he shared um, at the table, but my impression in our conversation was that that was not necessarily echoed by the committee in full. And so, um, again, I, I just felt that I, I was surprised to see, based on the working group sessions and wish lists, that um, there was the additional appraiser um, funded. Um, and then when I saw that, you know, the sources where we were getting to fund that additional position um, required a reduction in public works transportation staffing, I just genuinely feel that that is more crucial for uh, meeting our transportation goals. Thank you. Well, thank you, Council Lady. You're the last speaker in the queue. Um, your amendment to the amendment, or otherwise known as Amendment 11, has been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Opposed. And then we will be having all 11 votes on all 11 amendments, including the withdrawn ones tomorrow night. Um, so that being said, having had lengthy discussion on the amendments to 722, uh, Council Lady Weiner. On your number 10 that you put up, I've just got a quick question procedurally. Um, was that allocation that you identified discussed with the Department of Finance? It, it was not, since I've not left my chair <laughs> since 4 o'clock. <laughs> but it is Ew. approximately less than 2% of that number. So I, I advance it cautiously with reservation, uh, but just in order to have it on our agenda to tomorrow night, that it's a question of 2% out of a different fund uh, matching against the historic preservation grant. And I appreciate the willingness to suspend the rule in order to have uh, an Amendment 10. Is it appropriate for me to ask that tomorrow night the Finance Department be prepared to share with us the impact of that, number one, number two, an alternative source for funding? Well, certainly very appropriate. Okay. And, um, Can y'all do that, please, Talia? I might be able to comment on a recommended solution, but I wouldn't be prepared to recommend what the uh, alternative source may be. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Council Lady. Um, so with all that being said, with our wonderful discussion, um, the 722, uh, the substitute with our 11 amendments headed to us tomorrow night, um, the substitute and the amendments. Thank you, Chair Lady. Um, there's a, is there a motion? Motion made and seconded. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? That is uh, recommended to the council. And we are done. Unless anybody has something else, we are adjourned until tomorrow. Thank you very much. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.